Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, dear audience, I warmly welcome you all at the high-level International Money Museum Conference organized by the Modia Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary. My name is Cenga Gabriele Boya, and I am honored to be your host today. Today's conference is organized under the theme of the new era of financial education, aiming to give further impetus to the advancement of financial education and literacy. The rapid changes in our world have a profound effect on the way we live our lives and have impacted our relationship with the economy and money itself. Changes in consumer habits and financial products have made it harder for all generations to manage their finances. Young people gain their financial education from different sources and educational institutions are among the most important ones. However, different organizations and institutions, such as central banks and ad tech companies, can help to raise the financial literacy of youth. The Madia Nemzeti Bank opened a new financial knowledge center, the Hungarian Money Museum and Visitors Center, this spring with the aim of advancing the financial knowledge of the population through attentiveness, creativity, talent, and competitiveness by its unique means. The conference's program starts with a high-level opening session, allowing us to learn from the experiences of central bank governors and high-level decision-makers. The high-level session will be followed by two panel discussions focusing on the financial education of the younger generation and the technological and innovative aspect of financial literacy. Now, I am pleased to announce Mr. Chaba Kondrac, Deputy Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, who will deliver his opening address to commence our professional program. Please come on stage, Deputy Governor. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear excellencies, dear distinguished guests. Uh, we are so proud and we are so happy that uh, you are here uh, in our uh, brand new building, which is the center of the supervisory part of the central bank. And also here uh, we can find the brand new money museum, which definitely one of the youngest museum in the world. It is my great, uh, great pleasure and honor to welcome you all of you here. Uh, within, the, within this uh, uh, conference, which we are organizing with the aim to give further impetus to the advancement of uh, financial education and literacy. Financial literacy lies at the heart of our economies and societies. In accordance with its uh, statutory mandate, the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, considered the development of financial literacy in Hungary is one of its essential tasks. Today's conference follows the grand opening of our Money Museum and Visitor Center on 15th March 2022 in this historical building. With the establishment of the Money Museum, the Central Bank of Hungary has created a unique visitor center in Hungary and also in the international schemes. In terms of the educational content and the innovative technological features. It is clearly demonstrated that uh, by the fact that uh, the Money Museum has already more than 50,000 visitors and it prepares almost always with and it operates almost uh, always with a full house. Albert Szentgyörgyi, the famous Hungarian Nobel Prize laureate and the inventor of uh, vitamin C, once said that the future will be like the school of today. By launching the Money Museum, we try to fulfill this responsibility. Full financial literacy and inclusion affects lives and livelihoods. Based on survey, only one third of adults are financially literate worldwide. This means that around 4 billion adults globally, most of them in developing economies, lack, of, lack an understanding of basic financial concepts. 
On average, Europe scores more highly at 52%, but huge variations exist. In order to grasp this complex topic, we have created a high-tech institution of the 21st century that guides us from our most ancient knowledge of money to the world of digitalization, introducing us to the money of the future. Among the exhibition items, we can find the most special pieces of the MMB's pri priceless uh, coin collection. We can hold a real gold bar in our hands and we can get to know the treasurers of the creative mind as well. The greatest innovation of this project is to convey the diverse knowledge related to money by building on games and experiences understood by everyone. In my opinion, this edutainment approach combining both entertainment and education was key in this breakthrough. We have lined up fun and playful solution to make the exhibition an interactive experience for young people who does feel the museum visit rather an adventurous journey than learning. The overall picture about money created by our institution must contain the world of digitalization and the development of digital skills as well, since the future economy can only be known and understood through these tools. That is why the Money Museum has created a complex digital educational platform on its website, which offers both teachers and students an extremely wide selection of valuable education content. It can be considered a pioneering initiative on a global level that the MMB issues its own NFTs, which can be collected in the application. Through the process, the users can get closer to both new technology and the world of financing by playing. In addition to creation of the exhibition and our own educational platforms, the Money Museum also places great emphasis on establishing relationship between national and international institutions. We consider its mission to contribute to the promotion of the sciences, the preservation of the values of national culture, and above all, the transfer of modern, high-quality financial knowledge, both within and beyond Hungarian border borders. Returning back to St. Georgi's thought, I believe that uh, if we look at the mu Money Museum as the school of today, we can be confident that we have done something for the success of the future. To conclude, improving financial awareness has always been important, but in current challenging times, it has become even more urgent as the geopolitical situation also affects people's financial decisions. Today, we have an impressive list of distinguished speakers number of the speakers, 19, representing 13 countries from three continents. So the opportunity is offered to exchange views on international best practices. Let me conclude by wishing you very productive discussion today. Thank you very much. Enjoy Hungary, enjoy the Money Museum, and enjoy this building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Governor Konrad, for setting the stage with your insights for some fruitful discussions. As the first guest speaker of the high-level opening session, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Mario Santanu, Governor of Banco de Portugal, the Central Bank of the Portuguese Republic. Please welcome Mr. Santanu. Good morning. Good morning, uh, you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Governor Kondrax, for the invitation and for the opportunity to share my views uh, on why financial education is uh, so important. 
In these unprecedented times, financial literacy has a vital role. People need to understand what is happening in the economy and in the financial world, especially now that high inflation is present and interest rates are increasing. Financial literacy provides consumers with important tools to help them become more resilient to shocks. Those with greater financial literacy are less likely to be or become financially fragile. When managing their day-to-day -day finances, they are in a better position to make decisions that suit their needs and goals. They are more capable of anticipating and dealing with adverse economic conditions, namely, namely by building up savings. Low financial literacy has a disproportionate effect on the most vulnerable groups in our society. Financial vulnerability and the lack of financial literacy are problems that compound each other. But that uh, there are also wider paybacks of financial literacy beyond the benefits for the individual. By becoming more resilient, financially literate consumers contribute towards a more robust economy. The financial industry itself also benefits from consumers who can articulate their needs and desires. By making informed choice about uh, suitable products, they help promoting a healthy, open and competitive financial market, therefore supporting financial stability. For Banco de Portugal, promoting financial literacy has been a key priority for over a decade. Within its banking conduct supervision mandate, financial literacy is a strategic pillar along with the regulation and oversight of financial institutions. Empowering consumers to understand banking products is a complementary approach to the supervision of financial institutions. Back in 2008, we launched a website dedicated to banking customers to keep them informed of the evolving landscape of their rights and duties. Soon after, we started implementing specific financial literacy initiatives, always benchmarking with the recommendations issued by the International Network on Financial Education of the OECD. Strengthening the financial resilience of households has been one of the top priorities of our financial education agenda, and its importance has increased in recent years. To support this endeavor, Bank of Portugal is currently working within the group of national experts that are writing the core financial competence framework for the adult population in the European Union. A project presented by the European Commission and supported by the International Network on Financial Education. We are committed to incorporating the framework into our national financial literacy strategy. The pandemic was a reminder that the world is fundamentally unpredictable and that financial literacy is an essential tool for managing personal finances to prepare for the unexpected. Additionally, consumers are facing a surge in inflation and an increase in interest rates, which reduces purchasing power, but increases investment opportunities. To promote financial resilience, our financial education initiatives have been focused on the importance of budgeting and building up savings, and on the responsible use of credit to prevent over indebtedness our training courses cover wide audiences, but with special attention to the most vulnerable. Sustainable finances have recently been integrated into our financial literacy agenda. It is clear that sustainability issues and individual sustainability preferences are particularly relevant to personal finances. In our activities, adults are challenged to channel savings to sustainable projects and are made aware of their important contribution in preventing greenwashing. Realizing that digitalization has been reshaping the financial services, digital financial literacy is a priority in our agenda since 2016. 
Digital payments have become the gateway to a broader digital finance system, enabling access to savings, credit, and other financial products. Essentially, a click away. In 2018, we launched a comprehensive campaign targeting youngsters who are tech savvy and feel comfortable with digital financial services, but tend to overlook security risks and lack financial literacy. With the experience gained from pooling efforts with other stakeholders for over 10 years, we are confident that we can make a difference in people's lives. In 2011, Portugal launched the first wave of the national strategy to promote the financial literacy. By adopting an inclusive and flexible framework, we received the support of a large group of stakeholders, including ministries, consumer and financial sector associations, and also NGOs. This network is growing in number every year allowing us to scale up the different initiatives and respond to the need for mass access to financial literacy initiatives. Following OECD recommendations, we have been revising our national strategy every five years. These revisions took into account the results of national surveys, which were conducted in 2010, 2015, and 2020. Portugal also participated in the first survey conducted by the OECD to measure financial literacy of entrepreneurs of micro, small, and medium-sized firms. In 2011, the priority was focused on financial education in schools. Since then, we work in close partnership with the Portuguese Ministry of Education, which made financial education a compulsory subject in schools. I believe that this is the key approach, reaching a world generation and developing responsible financial behavior for future consumers of financial products is a long-term project. To provide support for financial education in schools, we published four financial education workbooks for the different grades. These workbooks are devoted to the implementation of core financial competencies for children and young people. We also developed and implemented several certified training courses available for teachers among a set of different initiatives. Micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises have been in our financial literacy agenda since 2014, as I mentioned before. Following the publication of the Financial Competences Framework, the ongoing trainers program is underway and carried out with specialized institutions within the Ministry of the Economy. Other important milestones deserve to be mentioned, such as the launch uh, of a financial education program for the unemployed in partnership with the Portuguese Institute of Employment and Vocational Training. Also, the set of e-learning courses to promote financial literacy at the workplace in conjunction with various bodies of the Ministry of Labor, Solidarity, and Social Security. These initiatives highlight the importance of partnerships with stakeholders that are close to different target groups. Financial literacy initiatives have to be tailor-made to the needs and abilities of the different groups. We have to promote a more inclusive society, one that is more confident in managing its financial future in a changing financial system. By improving the financial well-being of citizens, we are promoting financial stability and the resilience of the economy. This is, again, let me remind you, a long-term project tackling generation and generation, so uh, this uh, will need our constant effort. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Centeno, thank you very much for your speech. Now, I'm glad to announce our next speaker, Her Excellency Chia Sere, Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia. Dear Ms. Sere, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Deputy Governor of the Moyo Nemzeti Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a privilege and a great pleasure to be among such esteemed colleagues today to discuss the new era of financial education on the occasion of this international conference hosted by the Moyo Pan Museum. The diversity of speakers who will share their views at this event is a unique opportunity to learn from each other, understand the specificities of each national experiences, and draw inspirations and lessons from our mutual endeavors in promoting financial education. Ten years after the Asian financial crisis in 1997, another financial crisis hit, this time on a global scale. It started in the most developed economies with one of the most developed financial centers. As a result, not only the financial system crumbled, but the entire world's economy came into recession. Many experts debate, uh, debated and continue to debate on the exact origin of the problems, whether it was deregulation, corporate greed, regulator complacency, or weak and inadequate prudential rules. But clearly, the environment of low interest rate as a result of the dot-com crisis in the year 2000 that made possible the ease of access to credit by household turned them into the first victim of their choice and ultimately the entire global financial system suffered. What happened in 2008 was an exhibit of how financial inclusion could go wrong. Undeniably, according to empirical studies made by international organizations such as the United Nations and the World Bank, access to finance has proven to be an effective tool to lift people out of poverty, provide better educations and health care for their families, and ultimately improve a country's economic development. But promoting access to financial services to low-income segments is also a risky bet and could have potentially negative implications on the country's financial stability, particularly in a scenario of too much lending. Going forward, balancing financial inclusion and financial stability would be a big task for many regulators around the world. So how do we increase financial inclusion while avoiding the moral hazard we saw in 2008? The answer lies in financial literacy. The more literate and informed people are on financial matters, the better choices they make for themselves and the better financial stability is preserved. While there has been a consensus on the necessity to promote financial education throughout the world, especially since the global financial crisis, our respective experiences may vary depending on each country's history, cultural context, socioeconomic pattern and demography. Allow me therefore to share with you some highlight of our experience and vision from Cambodia. As Cambodia Central Bank, there are two main objectives that our financial education program aim to achieve at the same time. First, financial education aim to promote responsible financial inclusion. Despite an outstanding economic growth averaging 7% per annum for the past decade and rapid development and modernization of the financial system, financial inclusion in Cambodia remains timid, with 60% of the adult population having access to formal financial services, 3% access to informal services, this is a decrease from 12% in 2017, and 30% completely excluded from financial services. Since 2010, many public awareness workshops and public gatherings were organized, but it was not until 2016 when a campaign titled Let's Talk Money was launched to try to bring all the industry and the central bank financial literacy efforts under one umbrella to better coordinate and avoid duplication. The campaign came in both digital and physical formats, to capitalize on the high mobile phone penetration of 124%, a young and a tech-savvy population, and 10.8 million Facebook users out of 16 million inhabitants, we launched short video contents on social media and collaborate with mobile service provider to include short important messages on financial matters at the press of a button and use mobile application to spread messages. There are two groups we particularly focus on, um, and those are the youth and women. We strongly believe that financial education from a very young age will provide Cambodian children with the necessary foundation to access and use financial services surely and effectively in the future, especially in a country where 50% of the population is below the age of 25. 
Therefore, we have partnered with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport to embed financial education in the national curriculum for primary, secondary and upper secondary school. In addition, we have also partnered with the private sector to publish and disseminate comic books and youth-friendly social media content throughout the country. The second important target beneficiary group I want to mention is women for the, for the financial education of whom I'm personally committed. The more women can access financial services and use them responsibly, the more they will be able to contribute to their families and community social economic development. Studies have also found that women are more likely to spend their earnings on the welfare of the family, such as education and health care, than men do. No offense to you gentlemen, I didn't do this study. <laughs> we therefore have partnered with our colleagues from the Ministry of Women's Affairs and the Women Entrepreneurs Association of Cambodia to support women financial skills and entrepreneurship skills. Ladies and gentlemen, when I mention the disseminations of financial literacy through digital platforms, do understand that not everyone is digitally literate, particularly the older generation. This is another challenge we have to face in a particularly digitalized financial system. In an era of branchless banking, where banking transactions are done on mobile banking application, digital skill is crucial to navigate this environment. While digitalization, ease of access or finance by making it faster and more affordable, it also raises more challenges for regulators to ensure that people are digitally literate enough to benefit from this new phenomenon. At this juncture, it is still a question to me personally whether as a central bank promoting as a central bank as central banks promote digitalization of the financial system, we should also lead the digital literacy effort or another public agency dedicated to digitalization of the entire economy should take the lead. After all, financial stability and price stability should be our main focus. Another objective of financial education in Cambodia, and perhaps a less common one, is to promote the use of the local currency, the real. Indeed, Cambodia is a highly dollarized economy with our national currency representing only 10% of the bank deposit and 16% of the money in circulation. This dollarization is not the result of an administrative decision, but rather an unforeseen consequence of the United Nations intervention in the countries whose two-year operation in, 20, in 1992 to 1993 was funded by a massive inflow of US dollar, corresponding to 75% of our GDP at the time. While it has contributed to reassuring and attracting a large pool of investors to Cambodia, I call it this false marriage between our economy and a currency we have no control over is nonetheless impacting our sovereignty and ultimately our ability to withstand financial shocks as it limit our efficiencies in the monetary policy. With a strong foundation already in place, namely a stable exchange rate and low inflation rate over the last 23 years, we therefore have undertaken a series of communication programs to raise awareness and progressively build the trust of the people in using the Cambodian real instead of the US dollar. In this regard, the National Bank of Cambodia has continually continuously organized workshops, public events and celebration throughout the 25 provinces of the kingdom to raise awareness about national currency during our yearly real day celebration and also on other frequent and regular occasions. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot discuss the topic of the new area of financial education without mentioning the National Bank of Cambodia's flagship product for education and awareness raising, raising about our national currency and that is our Presre Eisan Varaman Museum for Economy and Money. Inaugurated in April 19, 2019 by our Prime Minister, the Sosoro Museum, as we commonly call it, embodies, embodies many of the strategies I have mentioned earlier. The latest and most modern museum in Cambodia, it is an institution of international standard that has been conceived by a pool of local and international experts specifically hired to realize the vision of the National Bank of Cambodia. The museum has two characteristics that make it quite unique both in Cambodia and as a money museum. First, its permanent exhibition is organized throughout the historical narrative, displaying 2,000 years of Cambodia's history from economic and monetary perspective. This particularly makes the museum attractive to the general public and not just those with an interest in economic money matters or central banking. 
It allows the visitors to understand step by step such things as the evolution of money, the close connection between currency, national identity and sovereignty, the role of central banking and how economic and monetary matters are interrelated with political and societal changes. We highlight, highlighted in particular how one of the most sophisticated civilization in the 12th centuries uh, came to its decline partly due to lack of a monetary system and show how a monetary system play a role in shaping the political scene and sovereignty of our nation. We also reminded our visitors of our recent dark history between 1975 and 1979 when the monetary system was abolished by the Pol Pot regime and the entire country turned into a barter system. Of course, the regime didn't last but inflicted irre irreparable damage to the country and the people until today. The second characteristic of the Sosa Raw Museum is that, like many of its counterparts around the world, it has a strong modern and interactive component with more than 50 videos, touch screen, computer quizzes that allow visitors to deepen their understanding of the exhibition, to select topics to further information and to test knowledge they have acquired during their visit. This embedded edutainment component makes the exhibition dictated and attractive to all kinds of public. Furthermore, the physical parameters of the Sorcerer Museum has been conceived with two main public components. On the one hand, the main building houses the permanent exhibition, and there is a re re repository of knowledge where visitors can spend hours learning, understanding, reading, and acquire knowledge. The backyard comprising a garden, a restaurant, and a conference hall. On the other hand, it is designed to be a lively place where past, present, and future of Cambodia's economy can be discussed through conferences, gatherings, and temporary exhibitions that are organized either by the museum itself or with partnership as with uh, business associations, banks, and financial institutions, and developed partners. Finally, as part of the outreach program, the museum team regularly joins the National Bank of Cambodia and other partners event in the province, bringing along digital interactive component and exhibitions to the public living outside of the capital city. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shared today financial education in our modern area should be innovative, interactive, collaborative, and reach out to all categories of citizens. By doing so, we can create a society of financially empowered and responsible citizens and thus provide a bedrock for the lasting financial stability that we are all striving as central bankers. Thank you for your attention. Kasinem Sipan. Assistant Governor Sede, we truly appreciate your engaging speech. As the next speaker, I would like to announce Dr. Alexandra Hachmeister, Director General of the Deutsche Bundesbank, who will deliver her keynote speech via video message. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to speak to you today at the Magia Nemzeti Bank Conference on the new era of financial education. What better place to discuss such a topic than a money museum? I already had the opportunity to visit the Hungarian Central Bank's Money Museum at the opening event this year, and I really liked it. And what I saw there left a deep impression on me. With the museum, you have really created a wonderful modern learning and experience zone that imparts knowledge about money to its visitors in an engaging way. I would have liked to address you in person. However, because today is our national holiday to celebrate German reunification, I can only deliver these marks virtually. To a degree, Germany also has Hungary to thank for this holiday. This is because on 10 September 1989, Hungary opened its borders to citizens of the German Democratic Republic, thereby enabling them to travel freely to the West for the first time since the wall dividing the two Germanys was built. It was an important step in a series of turbulent political developments that led to the fall of the Iron Curtain and enabled not only a peaceful reunification of Germany, but also a united Europe. As former Chancellor, Helmut Kohl put it aptly back then, Hungary knocked the first stone out of the wall. 
Today, too, we find ourselves in turbulent times. The coronavirus pandemic and the war in Ukraine have significantly altered the economic and financial climate in our countries. People are feeling the strain of surging consumer price inflation. Many central banks have already started to raise their interest rates, sometimes significantly, in order to safeguard price stability. The business community and policymakers are searching for solutions to come to grips with this new situation. Those wishing to find their footing in these times of economic uncertainty need a firm grounding in economic expertise as a compass for directions. However, whether there is a broad consensus in society on the importance of education in and of itself, this is not necessarily true of economic education. Subjects in the field of economic education are often given only cursory treatment in German schools. And yet, a basic economic and financial education is important, precisely in troubled economic times, in order to make appropriate decisions about spending, investment and saving. By improving the distribution of resources, appropriate decision-making can contribute to a more efficient and stable financial system and strengthen the economy as a whole. Thus, in the truest sense of the word, economic education pays off. Or, as the US Brighton statesman Benjamin Franklin put it, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. We, as central banks, also have a vested interest in imparting economic knowledge. Our elemental task is to safeguard the value of our currency. The only way we can succeed at this in the long run is if people have confidence in our monetary policy decisions. Such confidence is predicated on them at least a rudimentary knowledge of the role, the tasks, and also the limits of monetary policy. The Bundesbank, like the MNB, therefore has a great interest in imparting economic education. We coordinate our educational activities in the Directorate General Economic Education, which I have been heading since the beginning of this year. They sent around questions such as, what is money? What is inflation? How can central banks deliver stable prices? We provide teaching materials and interactive media and also hold lectures, especially for school pupils. And we also train teachers as multipliers of our work. With our money museum in Frankfurt am Main, we have also created a learning and experience zone designed to reach all segments of society. In addition, this year, the Bundesbank has sent a truck on a roadshow which stops particularly in those cities and regions of Germany where the Bundesbank does not have an on-site presence. An exhibition in the truck provides information on the Bundesbank's key tasks and topics. However, it is the interesting conversations with the truck's visitors which, to my mind, provide the greatest value added. Yet, how can economic education be best designed so that people really learn something? If I think back to my own school and university days, I found learning easiest when I was fascinated by the content and delivery. That is also our experience at the Bundesbank. Economic education has to be exciting, stirring and captivating. Topics need to be presented in a way that fascinates and inspires people and reflects their everyday lives. Only then will they actually take up and seek out the educational options on offer. Young people in particular need to recognize that economic issues affect each and every one of us and are relevant to their ability to provide for themselves. We as central banks particularly need to step up to the plate. We are anchored in the midst of society with our fingers on the pulse of the era, and we are responsible for people's money. 
We need to be creative and innovative in order to provide captivating learning experiences that stay in people's memories. Firstly, it is a major challenge to present often abstract and complex central bank topics understandably and to tailor the relevant content to the specific target group. Secondly, the content not only needs to be conveyed in an attractive and polished format, but also imparted via appropriate channels. This is where digital services come into their own. We use modern technologies and social media. Yet the COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us this. As effective as digital channels may be, they can never fully replace personal contact. This is why only Bundesbank staff work at our money museum. Visitors to the Bundesbank should be attended to by people who actually work there. The same goes for lectures at school and universities. Lectures on central banking topics are held by Bundesbank staff. We have not outsourced our educational work to the private sector. Our HR marketing also supports this approach. The best ambassadors for the Bundesbank as an employer are our own staff who are enthusiastic about the topics and about working for the central bank. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is uncertain, maybe more uncertain than it has been in a long time, but let us not lose heart. Crises and challenges are also always a catalyst for change and progress. During the coronavirus pandemic, many people have got to grips with video conferences, working from home and cashless payments. This bears out the time-honored truism. Those who would harness and shape the future have to keep learning. In my view, we as central banks have a responsibility to stay abreast of developments and keep adapting our educational options accordingly. In the process, we can also learn from one another and endeavor to find the best way of imparting knowledge as we are doing here at this conference. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you an interesting conference and inspiring discussions. Thank you for your kind video message, Ms. Hockmeister. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Esther Hergar, director of the Hungarian Money Museum and Visitors Center, who joins us online and shares her thoughts on the importance of financial education for the younger generation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it is our great honor that you accepted our invitation to this exciting conference. I would like to give you a brief overview of some of our programs through which the MMB has been able to contribute to the development of financial literacy. Since 2013, the MMB has been intensively engaged in financial and economic education, always keeping three principles in mind. We work in an organized way along national and then institutional strategies. We cooperate with all relevant stakeholders, the government, the market players, and the education system. And then last but not least, we take great care to measure needs and results. A complex approach is important in financial education programs. Transferring knowledge is the first step, but for lasting results, more is needed, as financial awareness has many layers and dimensions. The basis is given by knowledge, but attitudes are also important as well as actual financial behavior. In order to work in a well-organized and targeted way, we believe it is important to see where we are in these areas and where we need to focus to our efforts. For this reason, Hungary conducted the Financial Literacy Service coordinated by the OECD INFI based on an international methodology in every four years since 2010. These surveys are carried out on a representative sample of OECD countries participating in the survey. 
The research allows us to measure progress in our own country in the time between surveys, and we can also compare the results in Hungary with those in the international scene. The results of the 2022 Hungarian Financial Literacy Survey are so recent that we are sharing some of them with you for this first time here at this conference. Our surveys show that we have made significant positive progress in the area of knowledge since the last measurement in 2018. The numbers speak for themselves. There has been a positive shift in all sub-areas. We also see encouraging trends in attitude and behaviors. For example, an increase in the willingness to make plans for retirement and risk-taking but there is still room for further improvement in the dimensions of attitude and behavior. Our latest results already clearly reflect the positive impact of the work invested by the Money Compass Foundation, with the support of the MMB since 2013 to raise financial awareness among young people. Our programs primarily support financial education in schools with teachers as our main allies. We want to help individuals and families to make responsible, informed financial decisions through programs that start at school age. The pillars of our activity are curriculum development, school network programs, teacher training, and talent management, all in the spirit of edutainment. Over the past years, the Money Compass Foundation has built up a nationwide network to develop financial awareness, which provides space for sharing good practices and teacher training in the base schools. Financial awareness expands the activities of the Money Museum. In the base schools, financial experience-based activities await school groups. Last but not least, the financial awareness helps talent through national competitions as well. An important part of the Foundation's edutainment is a collection of board games for 5- to 8-year-old children aimed to develop financial skills. Nowadays, online games, apps and e-learning materials with education animations are indispensable to approach the students. The Financial Hero Training Gap is for primary school children. Secondary school students can learn more about the financial topics that affect them using the I Understand My Money app, while the Green Compass is an interactive way to show how they can make decisions that are more planet and wallet friendly. The popularity of our e-learning portal increased with the introduction of online education during the COVID outbreak, when the number of our users tripled, and it has continued to grow ever since. Our nine public e-learning materials are designed for teachers and secondary school students. These are also learning materials for Global Money Week in Hungary. Thanks to our textbooks and curriculum developments, all school children from grades 3 to 12 can now learn about everyday finance. The pillars of content development are our textbooks and publications. A separate finance chapter is also included in the mathematics exercise books. Our publication, History and Finances, is a booklet that prepares for the financial topic of the History School Living Exam. The publication, Let's Calculate Investment, is designed to support the practical teaching of mathematics in grades 9 to 12. And the novelty for the new school year is a set of nearly 170 math financial mathematics smart book exercises. Our textbooks and publications are available free of charge to all teachers, students and interested families in Hungary. Thanks to MMB's support, 570,000 publications are helping students with financial education this school year. Since 2016, a total of 2 million copies have been distributed free of charge to the schools. Our two textbooks with AR solutions 
are unique in the Hungarian public education. Please watch a short film presenting this. Both of the Money Compass Foundation's best-selling free textbooks are now available complemented with AR, augmented reality solutions. Similarly to the secondary school textbook, Compass to Finance, the pictures in the primary school textbook, Missions in the World of Money, are brought to life with the AR logo to make learning even more fun. Additional multimedia content is available through the AR Books Library mobile app, which can be downloaded free of charge to Android and iOS devices. To use the app, you must first register and then use the publication code BENZIRAIN2 following the instructions inside the app. A detailed installation and setup guide for the app is available at the link in the image. When holding the device's back camera over the images marked with the AR logo, they come to life instantly, along with a series of short themed animations and explanatory videos. And now I would like to introduce you briefly our new Money Museum, which uses interactive and edutainment solutions. The exhibition uses the latest interactive and educational digital tools to show the role of money in our everyday lives. The museum is open to the public free of charge following a registration, and its contacts are available also in English and in Chinese languages. Our goal is to become one of the most popular and most visited museums in Hungary in the coming years, and to ensure that every Hungarian student visits us at least once during the school years. We are proud of the fact that there have been already more than 50,000 visitors since the opening of the museum in March. The exhibition space is designed based on playfulness and edutainment. As organizing the exhibition, we have applied an unusual, not very common approach. A golden line or golden thread guides the visitor through the exhibitions and there are five hubs representing the five different functions of the money. At hub number one, we can understand what could show the value of things and objects if there was no money. At the next hub, we can see how and why has the form of money has changed. At hub number three, visitors can learn about history of the MMB, its task, the development, and role of monetary policy and the stock exchange. The next hub highlights the importance of global money. At the last hub, we can see the power of money to create treasures. The collections and works on display are unique by international standards. The museum has a 60,000 piece coin collection, which is the second largest numismatic collection in Hungary. Besides this area, you can find a unique exhibition of Hungarian inventions like the Rubik's Cube and the ballpoint pen. I would like to draw your attention to the Golden Train statue, which is a unique work of art made of golden rod shapes prepared by a contemporary Hungarian sculptor. The artwork symbolizes the heroic work of the MMB employees when they saved the country's gold reserves on a train at the end of the Second World War and fled abroad. In this area, visitors have the chance to lift a gold bar weight of 12.4 kilos. The value of the gold bar is nearly 220 million forints. We are very happy that our follower base continues to grow. We have a strong online and social media presence and the museum receives positive feedback and reviews. A 3D map virtual tour is available on our website, so anyone is free to enter and visit the entire exhibition. The Money Museum has its own mobile app too. The museum offers a wide range of digital solutions, unique games, and large digital learning interfaces with interesting animation and the video contact. We support education with popular other programs and events like Museum May Festival, Night of Museums, Researchers' Night, Autumn Festival of Museums. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, 
It is our privilege to invite you to our Money Museum. Please enter and visit us after the conference. Thank you, Ms. Hergar, for your insightful remarks. With Ms. Hergar's speech, we have reached the end of our first session and a short coffee break is coming up. For our online audience, I encourage you to stay close to the screens as our breaks feature excellent videos introducing the institutions of our speakers. After the 20-minute recess, we'll come back to the next session dedicated to financial education. Treasures lie in the former church of Saint Julien. An adventure awaits us. This old church is now the Money Museum. Here we can touch a real gold bar and see money as we have never seen before. We travel through time and space and discover the history of money. We can play and learn. See the first coin of the world, and the first banknote as well. Here we find the treasures of the museum and learn the history behind each coin. We can play in the museum. Which coin do we catch now? We travel through the history of Portugal and we long for the old days. Check this amazing view. Here we learn to distinguish what is fake from what is genuine. banknote with my face on it. We travel the world through banknotes and meet the lives and voices of people like us. is almost over. Will the secret of the Money Museum not be revealed? We unveiled a secret that keeps over a thousand years of Lisbon's history. We say goodbye for now, but this adventure isn't over yet.
a unique and unforgettable journey through the history of money. From the early trading kingdoms all the way to the challenges of the 21st century's fast economic growth, Sosoro Museum's must-see exhibition takes you through 2,000 years of Cambodia's history. Learn and test your knowledge with insightful displays, interactive technology and artifacts exhibited in a state-of-the-art museography. Visit Sosoro Museum and enjoy the surroundings of our heritage premises. The museum comprises several areas accessible to the public besides the permanent exhibition. What is money? When did people start using money? Why is money valuable? How many euros are there? Find the answers to these and other questions at the Deutsche Bundesbank's Money Museum. Interactive monitors, videos and games give you an entertaining insight into the history of money up to the present day. Visit our treasure chamber at the Money Museum, which is full of valuable coins. Try to lift a real gold bar. Experience our spectacular 360-degree cinema. And learn how the Euro system ensures that prices remain stable and why this is so important. Regardless of whether you wish to look around the exhibition on your own, attend a workshop, participate in a guided group tour or listen to one of our lectures. The Money Museum is a varied and exciting venue that makes learning an experience. Everything revolves around money here, but you won't need any to get in or to take part in any of our activities. We look forward to welcoming you.
El MIDE, Museo Interactivo de Economía, es un espacio cultural y educativo pionero en la divulgación de temas económicos, financieros y de sustentabilidad. Para el entorno digital, también diseñamos proyectos educativos de vanguardia. Tal es el caso de Pesadillas Financieras, el cual aborda de forma divertida y con ejemplos de la vida cotidiana algunos de los problemas financieros más comunes de las personas y los retrata en videoclips con nueve monstruos muy peculiares. ¡Conócelos!
Audience, welcome back to the International Money Museum Conference. After the remarkable speeches of the high-level opening, we are moving to our first session focusing on the future of financial education and the role of central banks and financial institutions in this area. I am honoured to invite Ms. Chiara Monticone, Senior Policy Analyst and Coordinator of the OECD International Network on Financial Education, to deliver her introductory speech. Thank you very much. Good morning. I hope you can hear me and see me. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers very warmly for, for having me and apologies if I cannot be uh, with you in Budapest. So let me start by presentation. The, the outline of my talk is very simple. So I will start by showing some data about levels of financial literacy among young people. Uh, then I will briefly discuss why it is important uh, to strengthen their financial literacy. I will discuss some aspects related to the financial landscape, but also some socio-demographic uh, trends and aspects. And based on this, uh, I will discuss some lessons learned uh, that we have learned through the, the INFA, the International Network on Financial Education. Uh, on how to improve the financial literacy uh, of young people. And this will be based on a number of uh, recent publications and recent work. Uh, so let me first start um, with the data. So this graph is taken from uh, the PISA uh, 2018 financial literacy assessment, which is the latest uh, results that we have on uh, young people's financial literacy. And here you can see that there is um, wide disparity on uh, levels of financial literacy, not only across countries, uh, but also and especially within countries. Uh, and you can see that in some of the participating countries, uh, more than 20% or even uh, larger shares of young people, 15-year-old uh, students in, in those countries, do not have uh, even what is considered like a baseline level of financial literacy. Um, so, so why, based on this, why, uh, why do we care? Why is it important to, to keep uh, putting efforts in place to improve their financial literacy? Uh, so in relation to this, I would like to discuss uh, some trends in the financial landscape, which are the exposure of young people to uh, money and financial products and services from a young age, uh, including especially uh, digital financial services but also some other trends related uh, to more socio-demographic aspects, like the need of young people to start preparing for independent and adult life, and other trends related to the shift of uh, responsibility for financial decision-making on individuals, uh, the growing need to finance uh, higher education, uh, and so on. So to discuss the trends related to uh, the financial landscape, I would like to show you again another graph taken from uh, the PISA uh, 2018 uh, assessment, which is showing uh, the percentage of 15-year-old students who reported uh, that they have uh, a bank account uh, or a payment card, be it a debit card or other types of cards. And you can see that these uh, shares are quite sizable, at least uh, in a majority of countries, if you consider that these students are just 15-year-olds, so they are, they've not even reached like majority age uh, in, in most of those countries. And we really see a trend of growing access of young people to financial products and services. There is also on the supply side a growing offer of financial products dedicated uh, to young people, which of course increases this exposure even more. Uh, so this, of course, is, is good in a sense because it offers opportunities to, to students to, to learn uh, how to use uh, these products. But at the same time, uh, sometimes this exposure may happen at a very young age when students may not necessarily have the, the skills. So uh, it's important that they really understand uh, the benefits of those products, but also the risks uh, and their rights as financial consumers. Uh, not only uh, students, as you can see in this graph, have access to bank accounts or payment cards, but as we know, they are increasingly using uh, 
digital financial services. So here is another graph taken from uh, the latest, latest PISA report, uh, showing to what extent uh, students have made payments using mobile phones or they have bought something online, whether alone or with a family member. Uh, and again, these percentages are very high in, in most countries. Uh, so in general, we know that uh, young people are great users of digital tools, including digital financial services, while at the same time they may not necessarily be experienced in, in using them and in making these decisions and how, understanding how they work. So, uh, for instance, uh, the, the availability of many cashless uh, options uh, for such inexperienced users may expose them to uh, like a lot of social pressure uh, to spend. They may not entirely understand, for instance, when they encounter uh, in-app purchases and this kind of sometimes hidden choices. Um, so all of this has lots of implications for their uh, financial decision-making as young people and as they grow older. And in addition to the exposure of, to digital financial services, we also know that through the use of digital tools or social media or other tools, young people may be exposed to a variety of messages, ads, uh, all sorts of um, uh, messages, including influencers and so on, that have lots of financial implications for, for their lives. Uh, and last but not least, as we have seen in, during the, the COVID pandemic, there is a growing, um, uh, growing development uh, of financial fraud and scams online, which in many cases uh, reach young people who may not be able to, to understand what is being offered to them. Um, and last but not least, there are more general trends that again underpin the necessity to develop the financial literacy of young people. Uh, as I mentioned before, young people are starting to prepare for their adult life, to, to live alone outside of their parents' home. Uh, they very soon need to choose between uh, continuing their education uh, or starting to work. And if they decide to pursue with tertiary education, they will need to decide how to finance uh, their education. So these are very immediate choices that um, will come to young students uh, very quickly. And then going forward, as they start to work, they will have to decide how to, of course, spend their first uh, salaries, but also they start to think about issues around pensions and retirement and so on. So uh, there are lots of financial decisions that happen or should happen um, quite early in, in people's lives. Um, however, uh, we see two, two potential sources of gaps that financial literacy may need to fill. One is within generations and the other one is between generations. So within the generations, we, we see, and this is what you see in this graph in, in this slide, we see uh, a significant uh, disparity in financial literacy levels based on uh, the socioeconomic background of the family uh, of students. So the bars that you see in this chart is the difference in financial literacy performance between students coming from socioeconomically advantaged family uh, with respect to those coming from socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, families. And um, so the, the, the magnitude of the size may not tell you a lot. This is expressed in PISA uh, score points. Um, but an average at UCD of 80 score points of difference between students from advantaged to socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. This is a very sizable uh, difference, uh, actually, with respect to the typical results that we see in, in PISA. So this is something to keep in mind. And this is to say that uh, there may be particular challenges for students coming from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, and meaning that families themselves may not be able to uh, equip students with all the necessary, all the necessary uh, financial skills that they may need. But in addition to this aspect, let's say within, within generations, within time, there is also an aspect related to uh, differences in, in the financial landscape uh, that people face across generations. So we know that there has been uh, a risk shift and an increasing uh, individual responsibility uh, especially around pensions and retirement, uh, but also more generally in financing 
uh, many aspects of people's life, from healthcare to education and so on. And this is increasing over time. So it means that um, the generations of our parents, let's say, they were not necessarily exposed to the same financial system and the same financial decisions as young people now. Uh, meaning that, again, families may not be fully equipped uh, to teach their children. So to address all of these uh, trends and challenges that I have briefly introduced to you, um, the OECD International Network on Financial Education has been working uh, around issues related to the financial literacy of young people and how to improve it uh, for many years. So in 2020, as you know, uh, the INFEP supported the development uh, of an OECD recommendation that was eventually adopted in, in 2020. And this recommendation focuses on financial literacy um, in a broad sense, but also uh, discusses the issues for young people. And importantly, uh, this recommendation encourages to take measures to develop the financial literacy from the earliest possible age. And I will discuss later what this earliest possible age may mean. Um, and in parallel, uh, the INFA has also developed uh, several publications looking more at the implementation side. So how to put this in practice, how to put in practice the, the recommendations, the, 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 the learnings, the lessons learned uh, of the OECD um, recommendation on financial literacy. So I will give you a very quick uh, snapshot of three main elements that I believe are important to, to keep in mind uh, in, in improving the financial literacy of young people, so how to do it in, in practice. Of course, please keep in mind that my overview will have to be very quick, uh, So, but again, you will be able to find more details in the publications that I have listed. So the first element that I would like to draw your uh, attention upon is related to, to governance. Um, in all aspects related to financial education, including also improving the financial education of young people, there is always uh, a governance aspect related to uh, setting up uh, a framework, which can be a strategy or other types of frameworks, um, to ensure that the, the results can be, the results of programs can, can be effective. And in terms of the financial literacy of young people, we have seen that um, there are two points that are especially important to, to remember in, in this area, which is ensuring uh, high level political support, uh, not only from the financial authorities, which are usually those most uh, interested and most aware of the challenges of the lack of financial literacy, but also from the education authorities. It's very important to have this collaboration from the two sides, the financial and the education side, um, because this is especially relevant for young people more than uh, for other target audiences. And at the same time, uh, because young people are such an important audience and they can be reached through uh, a variety of channels and stakeholders, it's important that all of these stakeholders uh, work together. Uh, in, a, in a coordinated way, and especially considering that there is a big and important role to play for private and not-for-profit stakeholders in addressing uh, young people, it's important to, to, to build this in a way that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't harm the, the, the ultimate well-being of the, the consumers, of the young consumers, meaning putting in place mechanisms to um, minimize or address any conflicts of interest and making sure that these do not harm the uh, ultimate goal of improving financial literacy and financial well-being. Uh, a second uh, very important uh, point that I have collected under the heading of creating uh, a supporting ecosystem is a number of elements that, uh, again, perhaps go beyond or can be considered as around the development of financial education programs for young people um, but that are crucially important for ensuring their success. So first of all, as we advocate for all types of financial education programs, it's important to start from uh, data collection, uh, collecting evidence to understand not only the levels of financial literacy in the population of young people, but also what are their financial attitudes, uh, behaviors, what they consider as challenges for them in the financial landscape, and how they prefer to learn. Uh, 
uh, young people may be a very special audience in many cases, and they may have special preferences for, for learning. Um, to support these efforts, uh, it's also important to develop uh, a competence framework uh, a framework that lists uh, within a country and with the consensus from all the relevant stakeholders that lists what are the important competencies that young people should have uh, in a country, knowing what are the particular challenges uh, within a country. And based on this, based on these uh, competencies frameworks, it is then possible to go steps further to develop financial education programs, to develop school curricula, um, to develop assessment, evaluation, uh, and so on. Of course, introducing financial literacy in the school curriculum is, is a key pillar uh, of improving uh, the financial literacy of, of children and, and youth. Um, of course, within the INFE, we are fully aware of the challenges that this may uh, entail from overloaded curricula to the limitation of resources. Uh, but at the same time, we see that there are lots of efforts and many countries are trying to pursue this path of little by little introducing financial literacy elements uh, in schools. And last but not least, it's important not to forget the role of parents. Parents, as we know, are the main source of uh, financial socialization, financial learning for children and young people about financial issues uh, of all sorts. So it's important that financial education programs uh, take their role into account by involving them, uh, by giving them tips on how to talk about uh, money within the family and so on. And as for all programs, it's important to uh, have elements of assessment and evaluation, not only to know if uh, a financial education program is being effective, but really to follow this uh, through time and in, in going back to the importance uh, of schools, it's important not only that um, financial literacy is in the curriculum and that teachers have the appropriate uh, training and teaching resources to, to make the curriculum effective, but also that financial literacy is being assessment, assessed as, as part of the normal assessment uh, that happens in, in school. Uh, which can also be a way for students to perceive this as, as an important topic, as something that is like a normal topic, like the others that is being assessed. And uh, the last point that I wanted to raise uh, is related to the, the importance of creating an, an effective design of financial education programs. We have looked uh, at the literature on this point, and with this slide, I'd like to summarize uh, some of the key points. It's not only important what to teach, what I have discussed before in terms of the competencies and the curriculum and so on, but also when to teach it and, and how. These are crucial aspects. So the first one that is the point that I made before when I mentioned the OECD recommendation is the importance of starting early. The recommendation doesn't start, doesn't set a specific age uh, or grade. This is dependent on, of course, the, the resources that are available. Uh, in a country, the context, and so on. But what is more important than the age is perhaps that the, the, the content and the pedagogy are adapted uh, to the cognitive and social and psychological development of children at different ages. Uh, so it's more important to do something that is really tailored uh, rather than necessarily rolling out contents uh, for ages when perhaps the, the, the content and the system may, may not be ready. Uh, we also see the importance of having structural and long-term approaches uh, rather than very short and one-off programs. Again, schools uh, are very good candidates to offer such a structural and systematic uh, approach that other ways may also be uh, possible. And uh, many, many uh, studies um, stress the message of the importance of experiential learning, which is learning by doing, which is really something that offers uh, a great opportunity to support uh, positive behavior change. Because we all know we do not just care about improvements in, in knowledge, that is important, of course, but it's not the, the, the ultimate goal by itself. So in the end, uh, the, the goal of financial education is to support changes also in behaviors and, and attitudes and learning by doing offers uh, more opportunities to do this 
And, and I know that after my talk, there will be a discussion uh, among money museums, which is also the uh, main theme of, of your event. And again, interactive museums uh, together with games or simulations, competitions, and so on, are uh, they are well placed to offer such a uh, experiential um, learning experience. So with this, um, I will conclude my very brief overview with just a few considerations about the way forward uh, of infant work in relation to financial literacy for young people. So first of all, because we care very much about data collection and continuing to build uh, evidence. Uh, so this year in 2022 will take place another round of the financial literacy assessment within PISA. Uh, it, takes, it takes quite a long time to not only finalize the results, but to, uh, to be able to analyze them and so on. So this means that the financial literacy results will be available in 2024. So uh, stay tuned uh, for more data. But at the same time, we are continuing to build um, implementation tools that can be relevant and can be used by different stakeholders to continue doing work uh, on this topic in the meantime. And in particular, as, as you know, uh, at the beginning of the year, the OECD and the European Commission have released a financial competence framework for adults in the EU. So right now we are working at the second framework uh, for children and young people, uh, which involves experts from both the financial and uh, education side. And again, this new framework for children and young people, similarly to the, the framework for adults, uh, will incorporate explicitly also competencies related to the digitalization of finance, sustainable finance, elements that are uh, relevant for young people in their let's say, future in their adult lives, uh, and so on. So again, stay tuned. Uh, we are developing these tools, and we will hope that they will be useful for your work going forward. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, here you have my contact details. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Montecone, for your insightful presentation. Now, I would like to call on Ms. Erzsébet Német, advisor of Pénzirány to Alapítvány, the Money Compass Foundation. Ms. Német? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce you the the financial personality test uh, because it was uh, launched uh, 20,000 uh, and more than uh, uh, 50,000 uh, persons uh, fulfilled the test. And I would like to uh, share our result as we conduct uh, research and uh, the and the uh, uh, result uh, will be, I think, very interesting. The question is, can parents learn about money? Then? We'll see. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, why was it uh, uh, so popular? In the beginning, we want, wanted to create uh, um, self-knowledge test and uh, and uh, after uh, after fulfilling the test uh, uh, computer calculate the results immediately and uh, respondent uh, uh, can get uh, uh, some advice uh, tips and they they know uh, your uh, financial personality uh, dimensions, weakness, strengths, and it's very interesting program for, 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 for children, for adults, for, for family. So it's very, very popular. And now is uh, being um, uh, translated in English. And uh, we, uh, we can uh, share after that but it's not easy to, to translate 
uh, well a, a test. You know, it takes times. Yes, um, um, we launched the, the test for adults, and uh, now we have a very nice sample. Uh, uh, contain uh, 25,000 respondents, and then uh, we launched uh, the test, uh, a special test for primary children student, uh, and we have uh, um, 18,000 uh, respondents. And the, the last uh, last uh, test was uh, for secondary school student, and as you see, uh, 6,600 respondents. Uh, answers will uh, we will introduce and uh, was uh, elaborate. Uh, yes, it's interesting. I I I I I have to say some 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 interesting result. Firstly, every age group differ uh, significantly each other. Uh, it's interesting for me because younger teenagers and older teenagers are very close to each other, but the the, the personal, uh, financial person and attitude and habits differ significantly, and um, and this difference is a surprise. We will see. Um, we we tend to think that. Uh, uh, if uh, older one is uh, uh, better in their financial conscience and, and habits, we will see. Uh, begin with adults. Generally speaking, I, I say uh, the majority of adults know exactly how much money they have in cash and in their uh, bank account. And if they are short of money, they put some aside. Uh, this indicates that in our country, money budgeting and saving is the most common financial strategy. I think it's not a surprise. But uh, building up a fund is not a preferred strategy among Hungarian adults. Uh, we created uh, clusters. I'm sorry, but I have no time to detailly uh, introduce uh, uh, clusters, uh, so I highlight some interesting uh, result. Um, passive hand hard working and order create value is uh, uh, our uh, conscious uh, clusters. Uh, hard working is very, very important. And uh, who order uh, order create values? Uh, typically, uh, make uh, uh, create strategy, and uh, and uh, uh, they they contribute uh, well the money, and they, they tidy in the household too, because the personality is personality. Okay, and um, the respondent. Okay. Okay. Respondent, uh, they they are not too conscious in their the everyday life. But if they face some uh, financial difficulties, uh, they begin to save, they dig into work, and it, I, <laughs> I think it's not bad. They have skill to, to, to cope with problem, and it's, uh, in this uh, uh, period of crisis, it could be very important. And uh, there are some, some carpe diem uh, habits, uh, uh, win some, lose some, Sometimes they save, sometimes they spend, and and um, and uh, uh, there is a vulnerable uh, low-income group. They have no money. They have no skills. They have no strategy. They are vulnerable. Okay. Um, continue with the secondary school student. The question is whether they more or less conscious than adults. 
Secondary school students are even more conscious than adults on some issues. Secondary school students agree most that they decide how, they, uh, how to spend their money. Yes, <laughs> that was his favorite uh, statement. And in achieving uh, financial goals, they consider working and saving even more important than adults. It's good to know, I think. Uh, we found um, uh, seven clusters. Um, the independent, you know, independent and conscious, and conservative, uh, the highest. Uh, conservative uh, tend to copies, uh, copy the children, and uh, the independent and conscious, you know. And there is uh, a conscious and a vulnerable, not too big, and innovators. A new uh, cluster. Uh, it's not a surprise, they like gadget. They like electricity. They like smartphone and smart power and clock and... They, they, they will use the newest technique for the banking behavior or financial uh, uh, affairs. Um, yeah. Primary school students, young teenagers. Yes. Um, we, uh, we found uh, uh, similarly than the OECD because they are exposed to temptation that encourage them to consume. They spend a lot, uh, uh, spend a lot on entertainment, on things that are cool or that appeal to them. I think it's not a surprise. Okay. They are lagging behind adults and secondary students in the conscious use of money. So they have to borrow more often, or they cannot say what they have spent their money on. And uh, the clusters, uh, the clusters uh, um, underline, the, underline this uh, phenomena. Yes, uh, the biggest uh, cluster is uh, uh, conscious about carpe diem uncertain, and money pits uh, can show for, for us uh, that they, they, they can't uh, control the spending. Yes. It's not a problem. Be young, very young, I think. Ah, my favorite uh, statements. <laughs> Who is the good parent? Uh, the question was for adults. Well, not, not, not a question. It's a, it's a statement, and they have to uh, have to uh, uh, sign in a uh, five-point uh, scale uh, the agreement. So the statement was: I want to give everything to my children. And the score of adults was uh, 3.6. Quite high level, I think. It's not good. Because if uh, somebody uh, wants to give everything for their children, they won't uh, be, uh, uh, won't control, they won't be able to control uh, their finance and they can't uh, uh, create reliable uh, financial strategy and implement it. And uh, it's not good uh, uh, according to the uh, socialization and education for, for children. But we have a good news. Because uh, the statement was for children, for teenagers, Good parents buy their, buy, buy their children everything they ask for. The secondary school student scored 2.19, and the primary school student scored 2.37, significantly, significantly 
flower. I think it's a good news. And I think parents uh, have to know that. It would, be maybe, it would be a reassurance for them if they know, if they knew uh, that uh, they, their children seemingly very demanding, that they can understand the financial frameworks. Summary. I begin uh, with uh, that uh, the three age group differ, but there are some similarity. Uh, firstly, across all the uh, three age group, respondents perceive themselves as having positive attribu attribute in terms of financial literacy, while those with negative content are at the bottom of the list and of most, most difficulties and depth. And for adults, secondary school students, but especially, especially for children, the biggest challenge to resist consumer temptation, to exercise moderation and discipline. And conclusion, the last uh, uh, slide. The primary school student, but especially the secondary school age group, have higher than expected money, uh, money management skills, major financial habits. They are willing to work for money. They know exactly how much money they have and decide how, how to spend it. But they are more exposed to temptation to consumer than adult. Adults, on the other hand, a higher every score for statement about being considerate before making purchase, I think it's very important, and being tidy. Our financial behavior is also influenced by financial education. The youngest are often still reckless, why adults are more experienced, but in many respects they are being overtaken by secondary school students who are beginning to benefit from the impact of financial education, we hope. Thank you very much. Thank you for the engaging speech, Ms. Nemeth. Dear guests, we have arrived at the first panel discussion of our event. Our distinguished panelists are joining us from France, Mongolia, Portugal, and Mexico. The discussion will be moderated by Ms. Judith Pop, head of the Financial Literacy Center of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary. Ms. Pop. Now, now, I am pleased to welcome to the stage our distinguished speakers. Mr. Philippe Genest, director of Citico in Paris. <laughs> Mr. Batsehan Namke, economic advisor to the governor of the Central Bank of Mongolia. <laughs> Mr. Bruno Proenza, director of communication and museum department of Banco de Portugal. <laughs> And Ms. Silvia Singer, Director General of Museo Interactivo de Economia in Mexico City. <laughs> Esteemed speakers, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our first conference panel in the subject financial education strengthening the financial literacy among the young generation. It is my honor to moderate the following conversation. We have three continents and four countries around the table. So I'm sure that we are going to have a very interesting conversation with many special national experiences and challenges. Um, Mr. Helgar has already presented the Hungarian efforts and results. So now I would like to ask our panelists to share their experiences and ideas about different questions and issues of financial literacy. First, I would like to uh, turn to Ms. Singer. Uh, as far as I know, your institution, the MIDA, the Interactive Museum of Economics in Mexico City, is the first museum in the world 
uh, which was dedicated to explaining topics, economics, finances, and sustainable development. I would like to ask you to introduce your organization briefly and maybe the connection to the central bank. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really um, thank the Central Bank uh, of Hungary for this uh, invitation and the possibility of talking to, to, to you this, this morning. Effectively, the Central Bank uh, of Mexico in the year of 2001 um, had this idea that they needed to promote economic and financial education amongst society in order to be able to perform their duty um, in a better way. And I'm not going to explain uh, what their duty is because we all work in the same situation. Most of us, we work for central banks. Uh, so they started envisioning in a strategy to be able to build up this museum. There were other museums in the world, but more devoted to numismatics and uh, with one, two, or a few few exhibits um, about how the central bank worked. I think that the best experience at the time being was the Wundersbank in, in, in Germany, which I had the fortune of visiting then. But the point here was to find a new way to express a more thorough topic. I really do not want to concentrate very much on what we did 20 years ago, but I want to tell you it was an amazing adventure. And mainly because those of, all, those of us designing who came from the world of interactive museums and education discovered the power of financial and economic uh, education by following a strategy that was uh, very well known uh, about how to communicate science in general terms and how to do the best possible performance in education using the museum as the medium to, to do it. So our, our approach was probably the other way around than the approaches that many of your institutions have followed. Instead of thinking, we need to communicate this topic, how do we do it? We had the experience of what is effective while trying to educate in a museum. It was a, a long process, took us a little more than four years, and finally in 2006 we opened. At that time, and we still keep on doing the same, and I just want to go very rapidly through this, we put the visitor at the center of our design. We never forget the topics we need to communicate, and we are very clear about the messages that the institution wants to deliver. But we study the audience. We try to understand who we are addressing, their level of understanding, their level of reading, the, the kind of games that will be more effective for them. And here, um, this is something probably we will re, re come again and visit again during this conversation. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, because times have changed. And for me, it is important not to talk about the museum we thought about 16 years ago or 20 years ago, but the kind of things we have learned during all this time. Because the world has changed. Um, people who visit our museums are changing. And this is the kind of first message I would like to share with you. Do not think that we have the magic recipe to solve all the problems. Because society is moving and changing all the time. Learning styles are changing all the time. And the needs and desires of our visitors are changing as well. Our country's needs are changing. So we need to be very attentive to that if we really want to deliver a good message. Uh, we also will talk later and in the following panel Technology is a wonderful tool, but it's not the panacea. It's not the solution. It's the solution when it is correctly targeted for those that are going to use it. So um, I just want to finish by saying yes, uh, MIDE was founded by the central bank. But at that time, they didn't have the understanding that we have now about the power of this kind of education. So part of the agreement was that when we started functioning, uh, 2006, we would become independent. So 
Of course, we, we will maintain our very close link with the central bank. Most of our advisors come from there. We have continuous conversations about topics and things that are relevant, but our operation is totally independent. And just to make it a little more complicated for us, because we charge the entrance, we fundraise, and we do a lot of things that regular museums do, it just to complicate it a little more, uh, last year, the central bank opened a second museum. This second museum is about the, the functions of the central bank, and we are very pleased to share with you that this second museum was designed by us, by Mire, using all our knowledge, using all our experience. So now we are two institutions living side by side with a very interesting result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, okay. uh, Mr. Prensa, uh, the Money Museum of Banco de Portugal opened in 2016, so you have a five-year track record, so more than five years. Please um, introduce your institution and your activity. So, good morning, you all. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here and an honor to... My name is Inamino Verdo Centeno, also want to say thank you for this invitation. Um, so, uh, as the governor already uh, explained, in Portugal, uh, <laughs> financial education is not an exclusive role from central banking. We have this national program with central banking and uh, the insurance market and the, the insur and market supervision and the government. So, we have this uh, governmental and uh, uh, national governance model to financial education. So, the museum is one of part of this pillar and is our part from central banking and uh, we normally work with young students. We made the opposite movement that you made because at the start the, our money museum is basically a numismatic museum because Bank, the Bank of Portugal is the best numismatic collection in Portugal. That's normal because we're a central bank. So we start to have this very good collection, and the museum, when it started, it started to expose the numismatic collection. Mm -hmm. And it, it basically counts the story about the relationship with money with society, with it people. And then, of course, we understand, we understand that we have a lack of one role, that is explain financial concepts and financial education. And broadly, we, we made several surveys in Portugal, and we understand that uh, uh, most of the people Included young people not understand the role and the mission of the central banking. So, in, so nowadays we inaugurate two new galleries that uh, precisely has the objective to explain the role, the mission, the functions of central banking, and of course financial and uh, uh, in the economic concepts. And we do it uh, in our recipe. It's not different from the other money museums with a lots of interactive and digital games and, uh, and uh, initiatives. Um, and we work mostly with schools. So 30%, almost 30% of our uh, uh, audience is mostly students from schools. During the week, we receive students and uh, uh, we work with them. Just uh, uh, so nowadays, one part of our programmation is mostly financial education and financial literacy, and try to explain the role, what is monetary policy, what is payment systems, what is digitalization. Um, and with COVID, I think, and that was one that we already mentioned, that is the digital question, the digital issue. And I think that COVID uh, was a very important uh, turning point. Uh, in Portugal, we, we see that the payment system and the use of payment system, digital payment system, just exploded with COVID, uh, uh, mostly on young people. And at, Bank of, at our money museum also changed a little bit our strategy and increased a lot our digital strategy and our social media uh, strategy. So, and gamification also. So now we have uh, uh, three new games that we call gamification and try to exp explain financial concepts and uh, uh, financial literacy and economic concepts that, that can be used to schools and are released in our website. 
and uh, and we start to increase a lot the use of social media, namely Instagram, because it's the most uh, social media that uh, young people in Portugal uh, use it. Um, the results are quite acceptable, but I think that the, the and I agree when you say it's not the, the panacea for all the problems. And I think that we have a big challenge when we try to use social media because we have the easy way and the hard way. And the easy way, that is the most common way, which we just pick our experience at physical and try to, and try to transfer that to digital. Uh, and the results, I think, will not be so good if we do it that way. It is the easy way, but it's not so good. I think that we should try to conceptualize the social media experience from the beginning as a, 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 a new product with its own strategy, with its own goals, and with its own contents. Because, uh, as you all know, uh, students and young people, as they are their, their own view of the society, and you see the results, they use digital payments. Already in Portugal, they all use it. We have a, a call in Portugal that is MBA way, that is you can pay digital, and all the, all the young people use it. But uh, they, they most of the time not use it correctly. So we have, as of necessity, and also say it, new campaigns try to alert them to be careful when they use the digital payments. Um, and so, to conclude, we try to have this specific strategy to social media in our money museum, try to target and try to uh, improve the engagement with this kind of young people and try to pass these new concepts that all, they also can find it in the money museum, but we try to try to work it in a dual way, in two way uh, uh, role. Um, and so I think that this, this kind of digital strategy and social media will be a big challenge for us in the future if we want to uh, uh, have the capacity to uh, engage and pass our concepts and this kind of warnings uh, to the young generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cuenca. Um, maybe Virginas um, from Paris. You have a beautiful museum building opened in 2018. Please introduce the activity. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, it's a beautiful uh, building. It's a um, Renaissance castle inside Paris. Uh, it is a, a building that was a dream. It was built by a banker. And uh, it was uh, a branch from the Banque de France during uh, almost one century. And uh, inside this building, we, we create a museum. It, it, I, I, don't, I can't say that it's a money museum. It's an economics museum. Uh, inside, we talk about money, of course. But we talk about economics first. Um, for example, we have six parts of the main exhibit. First one, we talk about exchange economic proof because we have to exchange. And inside, we talk about money. After, we talk about players of, in economics. Uh, markets, the, it's a third part. Uh, crisis um, and uh, regulation. And uh, the, um, the piece of the cake <laughs> is vault with uh, economic, uh, with um, um, coins. Uh, it's a very beautiful uh, collection of uh, Banque de France on the uh, Bibliotheque of France. And we, we don't have, we don't we be very lucky because we opened the museums uh, six months before COVID. <laughs> so we don't open the museum during one year. <laughs> But we, we can see, we open, we close, we open, we close, as, as everybody, everybody in the world. But we can see that the average um, visit in the, in the museum is two hours on and a half. It's a long time. People are very uh, happy to be here, very satisfied to be here. Um, and it was not easy because, um, you know, on the scale of fun things to do at Paris, 
uh, on the mind of people who are not even on the scale in plan. So it's the most difficult to do is to bring people inside the building. But when they are inside, they are very happy. Yes. So uh, it's um, 6,000 square meters, uh, the half for the main exhibit. But we have uh, also uh, different activities like a uh, uh, cultural program with a uh, uh, temporary exhibit, conference, theater uh, performance, workshops. Uh, we try to have activities to uh, each segment of the public. The goal is to have uh, 100,000 people in a year. And we are at 65, 70% of this goal at this moment. So we are close. Very ambitious. Mr. Bacheka, uh, the Bank of Mongolia also has a very attractive coin <coughs> exhibition in Ulaanbaatar. I had the pleasure to visit it in the building of the Central Bank. Please tell us some words about your activity. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you to the uh, Central Bank of Hungary for the invitation to participate in the open conference. Good morning to everyone. And yes, uh, the Bank of Mongolia opened the money museum the last year and uh, the occasion was that we, the same as in the Hungary we uh, built a new central bank building in this build, in this new building we uh, had the room for money museum and uh, I think it's the uh, most uh, visited uh, museum in the in the Mongolia and, uh, as the similar case in, as in other countries uh, we also had the uh, National Financial Literacy Program. We used the, uh, the museum as the, as the part of the learning process for the, our visitors. Also, we, under the national program, we had the educational program with uh, secondary school students and other uh, young people under the age of 25. And we used the, uh, we invited them to the museum and we explained the, uh, what's the uh, uh, central bank doing first of of all, and uh, the museum, of course, is the <coughs> preservation of the past, and uh, we're trying to uh, explain them the uh, history of the, uh, the money, is the, the, the gold standards, and uh, what happened in the, uh, the Bretton Woods system, then the uh, dollar pack to the gold, and the pegging, and uh, because the, um, the current environment, the, uh, the central bank is issued. Uh, public money, but uh, and, uh, also the private money is taking off in the world, like the cryptocurrency, stable coins, and there's uh, usually from the young people a lot of questions about those crypto assets, and uh, we're trying to explain the history of the money and the difference between the definition of the money and the fiat, what they call the, the uh, central banks of money. and. Uh, that's the uh, explanation is quite important for the young people to understand because for policymakers, for central bank, uh, it's uh, the stability is keeping and we want to a bit in the market environment, also in the financial and banking sector. But uh, as the young people, they quite uh, risk lower and uh, they want to sort of make a lot of financial decisions which may uh, turn negative in the future. So. Uh, uh, trying to not only uh, so first of all we want to broad out the coverage of the all the students so we want to cover the all uh, country students then we want to put more importance on the quality of the knowledge and uh, we're trying to explain to the students uh, what's the important uh, so you have to think about the liabilities in your life like uh, you have to Finance your education, your family, and uh, also the uh, uh, contingent liabilities you might have. So that's very important. And the, uh, all financial assets have the volatility, and they have to understand the risk factors. What's, what is affecting those uh, values of those instruments and those things? So the, the museum is the part of it, and uh, so the we of course uh, under the national program we did a lot of. Uh, teaching and lecturing, but uh, I think the, 
Yeah, also, the important thing is to do it in the practice. So, yeah, also the collaborating with the banking system and uh, they are now trying to also to uh, create new programs and uh, the our banks also trying now to issue that there are some modern monetary cards to students and just the students can experience with the payments and also the uh, how it works and also they can uh, the banks can introduce with the card the link to the uh, financial education links and uh, students can learn what's the uh, uh, risk and uh, return use of the financial assets. So that's uh, the uh, used the museum in the whole the national program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bacekan. Um, reflecting uh, to the words of Mr. Bacekan, uh, I would like to ask you uh, uh, about uh, the next questions. What is the connection of your institution to other major national programs of financial education? And uh, uh, but the second is how is financial education integrated into the school system? In uh, these are very, very important issues to hear uh, from Mr. Uh, Ms. Sophia as well. So please feel free if you would like to start. Okay. Um, very, uh, very briefly, uh, since MIDE emerged in 2006, the, and since the very beginning when we started designing, obviously one of the aims was let's try to promote that financial education and economic education is part of the curricula. But we haven't been successful. It's been 20 years of promotion. Many governments have come and gone in 20 years. And uh, we have promoted it uh, in front of many people. And for the first time, um, it seems like it's going to happen because we've been working along with the educational authorities for the last year and a half. Not everything is, is perfect uh, because our government right now is trying to um, is trying to put into education a very specific point of view about our country and about what has to be taught or not. But curiously, they have uh, accepted financial education as part of these, and we are very proud to say that MIDE has developed all the content because. Um, we are really the leading institution in the country. And we, we did this before, not, not for them, but for our teachers. Because I didn't uh, explain these, but uh, before COVID, we used to have around 250,000 visitors per year. And that means a huge number of students and teachers. So we did develop lessons specifically for those teachers to be able to carry on with what happened in the museum in their school class. And using this experience, the Ministry of Education invited us to develop this. But it's about to happen. We really don't know what's going to go and uh, what's going to happen once it goes through their technical departments. So this is it in terms of the country. Now, um, I want to clarify something that I think it's linked, but it's important as well. And I have had the chance to discuss this with some authorities that are the leaders at the uh, INFE and at the OCED. And it is that Again, I want to remark, as my colleague Philip did, that we are not a money museum or a financial education place. We are an economy museum. And one of the most important chapters of our discourse is financial education, obviously. But why do I make this remark? And I, I would like to share this, if you don't mind. Um, we believe that financial education and economic education and education in general terms nowadays is about decision making. And decision making is not about better or worse instructions. It's about really understanding what's going on. And it's very difficult, I think, for a person, a youngster, an adult, to have uh, tools to analyze reality and to analyze information 
which is again changing all the time, if you don't have a broader view of things. And economy is the science of decision making. So I think uh, the economic point of view of financial education is very important. And the other topic we believe it's very important is sustainability. And we know this bank, uh, the Hungarian bank, is very much in, uh, interested in that topic, and correctly, because it's, it's a matter of how we survive. I think that the economic decisions and the financial decisions we are going to make now and in the future are within the framework of sustainability. So this is important, that we understand that doesn't matter your, your mission is to communicate finances or allow people to make better financial decisions. This has to be in a context. If it's not in a context, it doesn't matter. So coming back to your question, and sorry for sli sliding these ideas into your question, Mexico uh, participates in, in a global scale. MIDE is a leader in that participation. For example, we coordinate the Global Money Week. Our museum does it. And, and since we do it, it's very successful. It's just because we are full time into that. And, and we are passionate about what we do. But, and, and more than 70 institutions participated in the last one. So there's a big uh, uh, impulse to financial education in the country, but not necessarily coming from the government. So, uh, as I explained before, in Portugal we have this national plan, and the central bank is only uh, a part of it. Um, the governance model is central banking, the insurance, and the market supervision. And then we have a lot of protocols with uh, lots of stakeholders, mostly the government, education industry, and the labor ministry, but, but other stakeholders like labor, uh, um, several laborers, and the and the associations from the companies. Um, we have started and produced lots of content to students and to schools. So we have produced books and e-learning platforms to, to uh, teachers. And uh, today, in the high school, it, the curriculum has topics about financial education and economic education already. Uh, so I think that first, these, that first steps, we already made it in Portugal. Uh, we follow uh, uh, the best practice from OECD, and you see it, the results that were, were shown in the, in the previous presentation. We are mostly above the average from OECD. Um, so now we are giving at this national level a, a step, like Governor Satena was underlying, to uh, the most or uh, other uh, uh, layers of the population that are more vulnerable to the crisis. So we have the unemployment, of course, and, uh, uh, and the older population that are less digital. Because again, I think that utilization from the economics and payment, this payment system will be a very big challenge in the future. And we have this gap because the older population, of course, not known and not control and not know how to work with these new ways of payments. And so we have this gap uh, of knowledge and uh, and we have endorsement and trying to endorsement that kind of uh, 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 issue in our national program. So uh, um, this is the, the positive side. Now, the less positive side. I think that this is a, a never-ending story in the in the way that you never get the results that you expect to, to get. I think we are always expect better results and better. Uh, 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 and in fact, and now I'm going to make a side comment if you allow me. Um, we made this survey in Portugal, and uh, most of people not really care about financial topics and financial issues unless we are in a crisis situation. So uh, uh, I, I think that one of our other challenge is not only to pass, of course, and teach financial education and financial concepts to the population, but also uh, uh, try to engage with them permanently 
to about these kind of topics because as, as I was saying, I totally agree, if they are better knowledge and better uh, uh, educated about financial, they could have better and economic decisions. So, um, so, concluding, in Portugal we're doing, I think, what is supposed to do nowadays, and we follow the OECD, the OECD and the, the, the best practices schools with students, we have a curriculum, we have, we have this e learning platform, and we have information to teachers, uh, we produce the books and the contents that are, that are available for, for, for everyone. You are now working with other uh, layers of the population, the older population, the unemployment, but uh, I think that the challenge is try to have this permanent way from passing this kind of information and knowledge, because otherwise uh, uh, people only wake up to the problem when, when you are in the crisis. And of course, we're now entering, uh, unfortunately, in a new crisis situation because inflation and, of course, the, the, the recent rates increase. Uh, and, uh, and for us, it's always thinking about these kind of issues. I think our challenge for the future is how to keep the population interested in these kind of issues in the case of topics, not only when they have it bad, uh, bad uh, times and bad shapes. Thank you, completely agree. Yeah, would like first? Uh, in France, it's uh, the Banque de France, uh, um, which has been designated as a, the national operator on uh, this issue. So we, we work uh, end, uh, in end with uh, 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 a service to optimize uh, the topic uh, cover it during a season. And uh, in the museum, we uh, regularly uh, invite various uh, associations to participate in meeting, conference with uh, the audience. Uh, so we have a place to give uh, visibility to um, many actors. Um, directly for us, uh, the specific mission is to provide uh, a lot of education content available on the internet. Uh, the idea is to be able to offer something to uh, school children, even if you are not to come to Paris. Uh, for example, in a few days, we will have a complete virtual visit of the museum online. Um, and we have a, a YouTube channel, we are on Instagram, Facebook. For example, uh, on uh, YouTube, we have uh, 35,000 people who follow us. On Instagram, it's 11,000 people. So we, we provide a lot of content for all these uh, audience. And uh, in the public uh, school, um, we talk about money. Uh, at the age of eight years. Uh, so school program including question about money and uh, its use. Um, but it's not, uh, it's in history program, in fact. And after uh, you, uh, since three years in France, we have, uh, uh, the Banque de France uh, has been chose to, to make a passport for people who are 14, for education uh, um, uh, of um, money. And we participate on these uh, activities, uh, especially during the, the uh, money week. And um, in, in fact, we try to, to collaborate with all the actors, because we are not a lot of people, we are a few people. You know, in France, we have a 67 uh, a million of people. Uh, we are only 30 in the museum. <laughs> so we can, uh, we, we can only cooperate with other actors to be good. Thank you very much, Mr. Batshakan. Yes, uh, yeah, our national program, the has uh, many stakeholders and the central bank is part of it. And uh, uh, for stakeholders, I think the main stakeholder is the government and uh, the government includes the uh, 
many ministries and the agencies uh, and also other organizations such as the uh, banking association and the NGOs uh, who is dealing with the financial literacy and uh, the, how the uh, main counterpart in the education program is the Minister of Education. And uh, we, uh, we had a long cooperation with the Minister of Education and we, uh, we, we were successful to put the uh, financial education curriculum in the high school for high school students. And, the, uh, and uh, our uh, measures and the program gave some results and uh, just as recently the uh, high school uh, students and uh, just fresh graduates uh, uh, asking the quite uh, sort of uh, educated questions uh, questions like uh, so why the uh, central bank still keeping the negative real rates and uh, when are you going to close the neg negative real rates or something like that the central bank inflation targets off the track and how the center was going to do with that, which is the, the questions becomes smarter and smarter, which is, I think, the, the results of our uh, educational um, process. And uh, I think the, in, in one generation, if you still keep the uh, training and educating the young people, I think uh, that will be put uh, discipline in the for policy makers in the fiscal and monetary uh, discipline because uh, the educated young people uh, will uh, ask uh, tough questions and I think the, the behavior will put the discipline. That's uh, the, uh, my thought and, uh, and also in, in parallel we have to uh, also um, train the educated teachers uh, otherwise uh, uh, the program won't be implemented properly and uh, we also putting some efforts to educate uh, teachers and also with, uh, have a lot of programs for training them and also uh, we uh, use a lot of events inviting the teachers from the whole countrywide educating them and giving them the, all the media access and also uh, other, pro other programs we are doing with other stakeholders and we uh, trying to also the, train the teachers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Batshaikan. Um, now I would like to ask you, what are the major challenges in your opinion regarding financial education programs for youth, especially changing needs and preferences of the target group? And uh, what do you think about emerging technical and communication tools? And uh, last but not least, what do you think about risks related to digitalization? I don't know who would like to start. <laughs> well, you know, complicated, very complicated question with many, many sides. Um, digitalization is here to stay, and it's not to us to. I mean, I think that the time, I mean, there's no way of saying, is it good or bad? It is. It's here. Definitely the risks are new and are different. Uh, we know all the security and, 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 and safety issues. But those, for me, um, the, the idea is really clearly divided into authorities required to provide us with all the safety, possi possible safety to operate the, the, the digital media and us educators. We, we just need to continue with our, with our same uh, work, which is, this is what we have, how do we operate it better? For me, one of the most important problems is the, um, the generational divide. I have no doubt that the younger generations will use the, the tool perfectly well. Uh, it's, uh, it is, they are used to this new way of communicating that is so, um, uh, sorry, the word in English escapes from my mind, but that you don't need to learn how to do it, that is really um, 
intuitive, uh, it is intuitive. But for the older people, that kind of intuition is not regular, is not normal. So this creates a divide. So older people are not using the means of exchange that, we, that the rest of the population is using. And I was in a meeting a couple of days ago in Mexico, and obviously the problem is not, well, let's just sit down and wait until the older people are gone and we will not have the problem anymore because everybody's going to be young and they will know how to use it. Of course not, and uh, I hope not for my own sake. But uh, the point is that we need to understand that all of these has to be intuitive. The, it was an important word because education has to be as agile and as fast and as easy as the the way of using the, the digital devices is. If we try to impose all ways of learning, we are out. If we want to, for example, if we want to evaluate as the old school evaluates learning, we're out. Because that's, that was your next question, and I never have a, an answer for that. How do we evaluate? You know, for me, the, the big thing is how do we evaluate um, positive impact in society? Very difficult. I mean, who's got this answer? But what I can say is the easier our tools are, the most effective they will be. The less we try to evaluate in a, in a, in a traditional way, the better we will understand what is going on. And uh, I think that is all what I could say that probably can shed some light. Thank you yeah. very much. Yes, uh, I think that uh, we have to uh, watch to that question in two dimensions. One is the, 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 the real economic dimension, and you have two, two ways. One is the, the, the danger of exclusion from the older uh, layer of the population, because they are not used to, to use digital payments and digital systems, so you cannot allow it that a layer of population will be excluded from part of the economics. And of course, the young people, they are digital natives, so for them it's, it's too easy, but the fact it's too easy, it, it's also a danger, because they could not, oh, it, they, it's, uh, I see my daughter that is 15 years old, and she buy books and all things like this, and I try uh, Sorry to give you my personal experience, and I try to explain to her that they have to save money. So to understand what I'm saying, they have to challenge to the young people because for them digital payments is so easy, but they and so they are digital native, but they have other kinds of challenges that we have to explain to them. And so I think that the challenges are different the layer of the population that you are working. And that was one of the main one one of the, that I mentioned of the problem. From our side, I think that I mentioned is we have to learn how to communicate these kind of issues because uh, most of us pass most of our time design and thinking about physical museums, and we are very good create great experience in our museums. We have great buildings. Uh, uh, beautiful, uh, 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 in our case, numismatic and games and uh, an exp interactive experience. But as I think, most of our young people are, are on digital platforms. And we cannot think digital platforms just like a transfer from the knowledge that we have at our physical museum to the digital platform. We have to think, we have to think in the, in the autonomous and the strategic way. So we have to like build a new uh, capacity, a new resource at, at our central banks, how to learn, how to communicate in the social media. And we think it from the zero, because the kind of contents you have to produce, the kind of language, the kind of design, it's different. It's completely different. Uh, 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 I, I will give you, and the, the, I, uh, share with you one of our concerns, TikTok. You know TikTok? My daughter passes all the time of TikTok. Uh, not Facebook, not Instagram, TikTok. I don't know what to communicate on TikTok. Sorry, I would say it to you this, this way. 
I don't know if yet central banks know how to <laughs> communicate the TikTok. Yeah. So, so I, I'm just saying this to, to try to illustrate the, tr the kind of challenge that I think that we are going to, yes. to, uh, to have to answer in the next years. Uh, I don't know if it will be talk, TikTok or other, but I think that uh, uh, and these the, the, the are other dimension of the problem. Because I totally agree. We, in the last, in, in case in, in Portugal, more than a decade, we work with teachers and with schools and produce books and contents and give formation and learning to the to the teachers. And of course, as, as I said, I, I said before, uh, it's in curriculum of our schools these kind of topics. But when you try to evaluate the results, and our PISA results are not so bad. I think they are, they are above average. But we, we, when you see cost benefit from the activities. We, we always doubt if it, uh, uh, it, the results are what you expect when you compare well with all the investment you already made. So I think we have to think the digital as, uh, uh, we, of course, we are not to abandon what we do in the past. We have to work, we have to continue to work with schools and teachers and, of course, and all stakeholders. But we have to have uh, this open mind about this challenge, about the digital, because the digital is going to change the consumer behaviors, but it also it will ob apply to us, central bankers and supervisors and regulators that have a mission to financial and economic education, you have to think in, uh, in, the, uh, in the more open mind and, and try to, to establish new kind of contents and new kind of, you have to be creative. And I think central banking in creative in the same, it's in the same sentence, not always be the what uh, it's, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure that we have all the, the, the capacity to give an answer. For example, in, on TikTok, we have uh, maybe 20 video on the half is uh, with uh, 50 view. On view of half is a uh, 200,000 view. <laughs> There's not a middle, uh, so it's um, it's like a black hole to understand what happened with uh, with TikTok. So, um, in fact, for me, digital is is a tool. It's a tool, so you have to use your tool as you want. Uh, but for me, the most important is to make some immersive uh, uh, things. So, pe why people are coming in our institution? because uh, they have to maybe learn something when they are on school. And when they came with their family, is to have a good time in family and to share something. So you have to, to make game uh, for these uh, audience, um, parents with children uh, and um, uh, teenagers who are to together. So. Um, with digital, digitalization, you can make game for all the audience you want. But it's very difficult uh, to imagine that because you, you, we don't have, one person has not all the knowledge to do that. We, you must cooperate with education people, with uh, sociologue, uh, sociologue people. Um, so you, you need a long time to, to, to create a game. Uh, for example, in the museum, uh, the most uh, uh, difficult game we made is about uh, 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 international conference. Uh, you can play with nine players. Each player is uh, representing is con one country in the world. It could be um, uh, France, uh, United States, uh, China, on the uh, international conference about uh, uh, warm uh, uh, um, river. Uh, and, uh, uh, this game is during 15 minutes. And it's not easy to success. So uh, you need to, to cooperate. And it's a, it's, because it's a game, you, you made it, and you learn more. more. Yeah, for challenges and risks. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with Bruno, and uh, 
the frankly speaking, uh, we're losing the game to the TikTok and other uh, social media. And uh, I think uh, even though we are producing a lot of uh, educational uh, applications, uh, so we, uh, we have to still compete with that uh, uh, social media applications like a TikTok or Instagram. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the day has only 24 hours. And the, from the uh, health reasons, also the, uh, we have to also the limit the uh, screen time for the kids. So, so that, that requires that we, we have to create a lot of entertaining content. So otherwise, uh, the, the time allocated for the screen will be losing to those uh, uh, recreational applications from the uh, uh, other uh, developers. So that's maybe the big challenge. And uh, for uh, school curriculum, uh, as uh, we are trying to start as early as, as possible. Uh, however, also the uh, uh, Minister of Education also the, has the, uh, the core courses, so we also have to compete with them. And uh, for them, it's also important they also that the core courses like uh, mathematics, literature, they're also very important for the society. So, uh, so we're trying to... to balanced approach and uh, we want to put the uh, financial contents into the uh, core curriculum. That's uh, how we want to solve the issue. So that's the sort of challenge we are having it, uh, to introduce as early as possible. And uh, uh, another challenge maybe, uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, we have to also incorporate uh, eventually the climate risk on the uh, our education program and how we can from what age and how we can uh, introduce it and when so that's uh, sort of the challenge uh, we having and uh, yeah I think the main risk uh, I, I would put that uh, uh, we are uh, educate, educating and we are teaching and uh, for the young people and a lot of other uh, target groups, a lot of about the uh, financial and economic stability. But although I think the uh, end of the policymakers also have to deliver that uh, they're doing the right thing. Otherwise, uh, if you're teaching something and doing another thing, that's a big conflict. And uh, I think that's the big risk. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sinjan. I, I, you know, listening to my colleagues, I was thinking of two things. One, which is that uh, electronic payments are taking away the physicality of, of counting the money you're spending and understanding that, like your daughter's case and my children and everybody's, and myself, you don't see the end of your money physically, and we are used to that. So we need to find new ways of controlling that. Uh, but again, that is the instrument. And then, uh, listening to Philip, I think that, and because this is about money museums, and the people who are here in some capacity are interested in the museum, let's do not abandon what is our uh, competitive advantage. We have a place, and we are humans, and humans love interaction amongst and with other humans. And this is the beauty of the museum as an institution. So it's very good that we are out there in the, in the web, and we have to be, because we believe that education should be a continuum. So you may start on the web and then come and visit the museum, you may start by visiting the museum, then continue on the web, or you probably cannot come to the museum, you have the web. But the important, the treasure, the very valuable thing we have is the space. And we humans, we like that. Uh, let me tell you, this is not just romance in my head, which is, it is, but it's also fact. In the research we have done with our, for our potential audiences, and we are redoing 30% of our museum, uh, trying to understand that we're not communicating to millennials anymore, that our audience are centennials, and most of them are between 15 and 25 years old. They really, they love everything that is electronic, but when they have the opportunity to be face-to-face, -face, in person, and discuss, and have a dialogue, 
that is top. So let's just don't forget that we have the institutions. It would be much difficult if we just had the web and then try to build a museum. <laughs> Wish luck to everybody that wants to do that because it's expensive. But absolutely agree, Sylvia. Thank you. We have time only for one question, uh, and uh, it would be following: How does your institution benefit from interoperation? Your country active global money programs already mentioned. The last, I would like. Yes, of course, we are uh, totally engaged with all international. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Peg of Portugal, is indeed the chair of Finconet. So in and presentation from the especially to the town itself, head of departments at the bank. So we are totally engaged. And we, uh, at Portugal, the many week, uh, um, it's not uh, again our only project. It's our, we, the Bank of Portugal with um, market supervision and insurance That is a collective project, but uh, we are uh, with. And of course, we, we learn a lot. I think that share a, is what we're doing here is very important. Yeah. Sharing experience, sharing mis mistakes, learning with other mistakes. Uh, uh, it's very important. And I think that this international cooperation, it's, it's a, way to, a very good way to do it. And um, let me just make a, a last side comment about data and about, the, and it's very important. We have data. Uh, uh, Portugal, we made this survey in five years. And it's very important to share data with international institutions because then we can compare and have benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So we try to figure out if we are doing uh, do it. One last comment, because we are ending our time, just to say that uh, uh, the digital, it's a part of our society and it will not be. It came forever, but we are human and social human beings. So at the end, we like to be each other. And, and this kind of conference is is the, is the, that that proof because we can do it by WebEx, but it's not the same. Uh, and we prefer to be here with each other. And uh, and uh, uh, so I think that. Uh, we will have the challenge with digital, but the, the, the future from many museums and other kind of museums are not in danger. We are not going to lose our jobs, I think so. So I think that will be a very uh, uh, long way to work with our museums, adding, of course, new tools and new channels like that. Like. Um, just a short... Uh, um, I think that uh, the most important for us, with me, and me, is to uh, be connected to the network of science center. Um, in fact, we are museum, but we are science center with economics as topics. But uh, uh, on, in uh, in Europe, for example, we have maybe 100 science center all around the country, and they they receive a lot of people, and they they, they need to have new activities. They need to have uh, uh, temporary activities. And we certainly have something to do with this network because to make temporary activities is expensive, but we, if we can share with others, it's, um, it's more easily to have um, enough activities for each museum. So it's, for me, it's a target, uh, but it's a long way. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, Central Bank of Mongolia is uh, quite active in international cooperation, and we are a member of the uh, OECD uh, literacy program. We, are, we also do doing this uh, global money week for saving the good each year, and. Uh, but um, our central bank thinks that uh, 
the cooperation among the central banks. There's a lot of room to expand. Because the, uh, the duty of the financial literacy came to the central banks quite recently. We think that uh, there's a lot of room to broaden our cooperation and learn from it. Thank you, Mr. Um, our time is up. We are forced to finish firing conversation. Um, based on our experiences, it is clear for us that real results can only be achieved if change in attitude takes place in the widest range. Uh, expanding financial literacy of citizens is a long term task. Well, that requires resources, time and money as well. Uh, results can only be achieved by well-founded strategic objectives and the efficient implementation of harmonized. Money museums, in our opinion, play a significant role in this world as they really open doors and eyes to finance economy, and by their presence and activities, they awake in economy. I would like to thank for our panelists for coming, sharing with us their experiences and ideas. Thank you very much for your patience. Dear Ms. Pop and distinguished speakers, thank you very much. I'm sure we all found tremendous value in this panel discussion. But now we have another well-deserved 20-minute break coming up. As for our online audience, I encourage you to stay tuned as our breaks feature excellent videos introducing the institutions of our guest speakers. After the break, we'll continue our program with a session dedicated to technological education.
What treasures lie in the former church of saint Julien? An adventure awaits us. This old church is now the Money Museum. Here we can touch a real gold bar and see money as we have never seen before. We travel through time and space and discover the history of money. We can play and learn. See the first coin of the world and the first banknote as well. Here we find the treasures of the museum and learn the history behind each coin. We can play in the museum. Which coin do we catch now? We travel through the history of Portugal and we long for the old days. Check this amazing view. Here, we learn to distinguish what is fake from what is genuine. A banknote with my face on it. We travel the world through banknotes and meet the lives and voices of people like us. The tour is almost over. Will the secret of the Money Museum not be revealed? We unveiled a secret that keeps over a thousand years of Lisbon's history. We say goodbye for now, but this adventure isn't over yet. A unique and unforgettable journey through the history of money. From the early trading kingdoms all the way to the challenges of the 21st century's fast economic growth, Sosaro Museum's must-see exhibition takes you through 2,000 years of Cambodia's history. Learn and test your knowledge with insightful displays, interactive technology and artifacts exhibited in a state-of-the-art museography. Visit Sussero Museum and enjoy the surroundings of our heritage premises. The museum comprises several areas accessible to the public besides the permanent exhibition. What is money? When did people start using money? Why is money valuable? How many euros are there? Find the answers to these and other questions at the Deutsche Bundesbank's Money Museum. Interactive monitors, videos and games give you an entertaining insight into the history of money up to the present day.
visit our treasure chamber at the Money Museum, which is full of valuable coins. Try to lift a real gold bar. Experience our spectacular 360-degree cinema and learn how the Euro system ensures that prices remain stable and why this is so important. Regardless of whether you wish to look around the exhibition on your own, attend a workshop, participate in a guided group tour or listen to one of our lectures, the Money Museum is a varied and exciting venue that makes learning an experience. Everything revolves around money here, but you won't need any to get in or to take part in any of our activities. We look forward to welcoming you. El MIDE, Museo Interactivo de Economía, es un espacio cultural y educativo pionero en la divulgación de temas económicos, financieros y de sustentabilidad. Para el entorno digital, también diseñamos proyectos educativos de vanguardia. Tal es el caso de Pesadillas Financieras, el cual aborda de forma divertida y con ejemplos de la vida cotidiana algunos de los problemas financieros más comunes de las personas y los retrata en videoclips con nueve monstruos muy peculiares. ¡Conócelos!
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our conference titled The New Era of Financial Education. Our next session, focusing on technological education, brings to the table the timely questions of how technology can support financial awareness and to what extent it should be incorporated into it. Before we welcome the panel discussion, I would like to welcome on stage Mr. Mateusz Rybinski, President of Fundacja at Tech Poland, who will introduce the best practices of the foundation. Um, good afternoon, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be able to give a speech uh, among such a distinguished guest. And I would like to start uh, from with asking you a question. You can raise hand. If you know anybody who got a victim of uh, financial fraud, maybe Ponzi scheme, uh, maybe some misleading advertisement of uh, financial instruments. Do you know anybody like that? Yeah, so in fact, I, I <laughs> yeah, even such, uh, you know, aware people can uh, be a victim. Um, so in fact, I checked the statistics in the United States just in last year, 3% of the population got a uh, victim of financial fraud. What is even more interesting, the money involved in this fraud rose by 75% year by year. And why it happened? Like many people say it's because of the greediness. We want more money. But I think the reason, re real reason is lack of education. I'm pretty sure if uh, people are aware how financial instruments uh, work and um, if they are able to see the red flags, they would not be involved in such uh, situations in most of the cases. And what are the consequences of this? Um, let me share you the story of my uncle. That will be a bit of a private story. So um, he was saving money for, for his retirement and um, his bank offered him participation in um, investment fund, which was called safe retirement, safe pension. So uh, he didn't have any knowledge about financial instruments. He uh, participated in this. And apparently it turned out that uh, this was very aggressive uh, investment found based on the stocks. He lost 50% of his savings. I think I don't have to explain to you how devastating it was for him. But the problem is bigger because he and people like him, they will never trust any uh, financial institutions anymore. So uh, later we have bigger problem because uh, people lose um, trust in financial institu institutions and then uh, they don't participate in the financial markets. And I think that's not effective and also the money do not circulate in the economy like it could be. So, um, as we know, um, there is a problem with uh, lack of knowledge about this and why we have this problem. I think the main reason is lack of attention. Here today we are in the sad, some kind of bubble because I don't have to explain to you that it's necessary, yes? But uh, in fact, like if we think about our educational systems, well, we learn about um, very sophisticated uh, chemical reactions. Uh, we learn about very difficult mathematical equations and so on. This is really important in some cases. But I guess financial literacy is something which all of us need. And um, I'm very happy because actually Maybe it's better than I expected, uh, since uh, today I heard a lot of about positive uh, sides and uh, I think some rise of awareness among educational systems, at least in some countries. In fact, in Poland, uh, just this year, from last month, we uh, started the 
subject on financial literacy and basic of entrepreneurship, which our foundation also was advising on. But definitely there is some room, big room for improvement in this, uh, in this case. The other thing, um, financial institutions, banks, uh, fintechs, um, they are very focused on ad, um, selling their services, offering them, but we sell this to people who, in many cases, they don't understand what is it about. So I think uh, there would be big opportunity if uh, we can use this also uh, for uh, educating people. And I'm very happy that this uh, Institutions like this appear, and in many countries, uh, very good examples uh, today we can learn about because I think that can be a space and an institution which can help with uh, digital uh, literacy awareness uh, on any age. Since I'm a leader of EdTech um, industry, uh, I would like to also share you how technology can actually help uh, dealing with this problem. So, um, first of all, coming back to banks, if we think about it, um, 10, 15 years ago, our interaction with banks were from, from time to time. Yeah, when we needed something, uh, we go to bank, but otherwise we didn't have any interaction. But uh, currently, uh, we have banks in our pocket. Yeah, so uh, everybody can access the, the bank anytime. It means also uh, banks, fintechs, they have access to millions of people. So as I said before, instead of just offering the services, this is a good opportunity to, to also make the applications more interesting, uh, engaging by educating people. Again, some statistics. Um, in the United States, that's the, where the most of the statistics are the easiest to find. Uh, only 30% of the households have a uh, monthly budget. And I think um, probably in our part of the uh, Europe, it's even worse because uh, we don't have this knowledge coming from generation to generation because of our history with the communism and not having the free market. Um, the other thing uh, which uh, we can consider is how to make the educational experience much more engaging and um, to create this experience to be really effective. As uh, also was mentioned before in the panel, uh, generations and people have changed and uh, they will be changing. So we have to adjust uh, the experience to new generations and our new habits. So if you think about it, um, maybe you can think about your uh, kids or niece, nephews. When you have to convince them to do the homework, it's rather not that easy, right? But if you think how they are engaged with the video games, then it's opposite problem to take them out from the video console or, or the computers. But the thing is, the mechanism which are behind the video games, games in general, can be also applied to educational experience. So gamification, uh, budgets, quests, uh, communities, all of this mechanism, we can use also to create a very good um, experience which is effective and engaging. Um, the other um, benefit of technology which we can use is actually allowing to have a simulation of the real world in very um, safe environment. So uh, technology, the proper software can help and simulate the real world. And uh, I have one good example from Poland. There is a company called Revas, which uh, they actually do the business simulation games, and uh, students imagine the group of uh, 20 people in the classroom. They can divide into four groups, uh, and 
they run business, uh, let's say travel agency, and each group has to make a decision who are they going to hire, uh, what the pricing they will apply, what the investment they will make, what inventory they, they buy, and so on and so on. And then at the end of the day, they compete in the same market. So they can see, okay, this group um, made a very big profit. And that group, for example, bankrupt. And they can actually analyze the consequences and the mechanism and understand what really uh, running business is about before opening any company. So as a conclusion, uh, I want to, to inspire you to think about digital literacy and how it can, it's, I think it's nothing like just, just to make it for a sake of doing this, but it can help individual, can help financial institutions, and it can help economies. And of course, technology gives a lot of opportunities for that. I just gave you some examples. Um, at the end, maybe I introduce a bit uh, about uh, our NGO. Uh, so, uh, at Tech Poland Foundation, we are association of the educational technologies uh, companies from Poland. We help to promote educational technologies. We try to uh, promote also good practices. Uh, we help companies to grow, and we have to establish international cooperation. So if you see any opportunity, uh, please contact me. We also advise uh, ministries uh, on the digital transformation of schools. And it brings a lot of uh, good impact because I really believe in cooperation instead of just uh, uh, some rivalization between companies. So we create a very big synergies in Poland, but also outside. Thank you very much, and uh, it was a pleasure to meet you today. See you uh, next time. Mr. Rybinski, thank you very much. That was a very interesting speech. Now, I would like to ask Mr. Bolaj Vinoy, President and Co-Founder of CodeCorp, and Chief Advisor to the Chairman of the Magyar Bank Holding to deliver an introductory speech on how the role of technology in financial education can be seen through the eyes of Central Europe's biggest digital skills and sourcing powerhouse. Mr. Vinay. very much, everybody. But um, to the earlier presentations, I tried to the scene and by the technology uh, digital skill shortage than the inside Europe centrally. So my role here is a little bit of digital shortage. Also I'm representing the company but try to solve and just because I'm a uh, banking expert at, at least my background is I'm, I'm trying to connect it at how they're connecting to uh, financial. Probably you know some of these numbers, but I think it's highlighted that according to the World Economic Forum, there is 1.2 billion jobs, which is radically trans transformed by the technology. On eight of the population, a radical Decade. Single decade, this type of, type of dramatic change. Of course, there was several big transformation in the job skills last one decade. For example, in, just in the US, there was early 19 of the uh, agriculture. Right now, this is these dramatic changes happened in so right now about a really big change which is hitting the society the economic that is a direct effect how we work together balance and how we think education what is the market dynamics I would like just highlighted three things from this slide which is uh, 
fast cool those kids our, uh, our daily business. One is that 50% of the European companies have difficulty recruiting IT. I guess most of you are yeah. Actually, even in Hungary and Central Eastern Europe, it's kind of like a hub of business. Yeah, there is a huge shortage of IT related people. And there is another quote in Financial Times that France faces growing threats of skill shortage shortages. Means this is really that's blocking capability of the companies to grow and also the countries. And the third one that the tech is splitting the US workforce in two. And this is probably the biggest hit in the society that is dividing the society in two parts, the digitally educated and the non-educated people. And the real task here is that how we are able to help those workforce part to be able to drive them into the other side of the, of the digital world. So let's talking, oh, sorry. Let's talking a little bit about uh, Central Eastern Europe. That's, I've already mentioned that this is a tech hub of Europe. And uh, the number is showing very well that how the number of people employed in ICT uh, business in the last decade. So that's if you see the numbers in 2011, that is almost doubled in 2020. So just in Hungary, from 1,000 people, there is 170 who are work, working in ICD. And this is a 70% growth in a decade. Uh, what you can see also on the chart, and this is a very interesting data, that Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia has doubled this number in, in nine years, which is showing very well that how the GDP growth is correlating uh, with the ICT and digital knowledge. Luckily, the EU is strongly focusing on, uh, on digital skill shortage. So the European Commission just announced the Digital Decade Program, which means that 20, uh, 20 million ICT specialists needs to be educated until 2030. And the good news is that this must be an equal proportion of men and women. Um, and also, which probably it's means uh, a lot of things for, for, for the European ones, that RRF, which is the Recovery and Release, Re, Re, Resilient Funds of the EU, it's uh, 161 billion allocated to digitalization. So 20% of the total RRF is, needs to be allocated to digital uh, programs, which means just in Germany there is 13 billion and this is huge numbers. And of course, if you see that Central U European countries, in Poland and Romania, this is seven and six billion euro. Uh, this is very good news that these countries, it just, even though that the, the suggestion is 20%, they even get it higher. So just in Poland, this is 21.3% of the, of the total RRF money. So let's talk a little bit about what does it mean from the problem's point of view. Of course, the digitalization and automation creating a, a growth in our global business. Um, and this is the growth potential for the companies and also a great opportunity for the individuals who would like to use their digital skills as, as an employee. Um, so you can see that this is not just about losing jobs. So that's even though there is 70 million jobs, which is in the next decade will disappear in Europe, but this is creating an additional 100 plus million new roles uh, in, in the European workforce market. So the growth potential is significantly bigger than what we lose because of the automation and robotization. So the good news is that this is as a business, it's also huge 
So this is a $180 billion combined market, just the digital reskilling, recruitment, and stuffing in, a, in the corporate business. And it's also a huge threat that this is 1.3 trillion euro, uh, sorry, dollar in the GDP growth potential in EU and UK together. So what is the big question for companies and what is the big question for individuals? That of course the individuals try to find that how I'm able to reskill myself for a much more safe and future-proof business like digital career and for the businesses that how I'm able to find digital talents and how I'm able to recruit them and how I'm able to reskill my entire um, workforce into the new digital world uh, opportunities. And of course, the recent potential of crises is, is just accelerates this issue. What we see in the pandemic, that the pandemic is just destroyed the boundaries uh, in the digital work for, for the digital workforce, so that the many of the Hungarian ICT specialists right now is easily working to the US or other side of Europe without any physical moving. So because of the simply online capabilities, they easily able to work for, for US companies or big European companies who are not invested directly into, into Hungary. Um, what we have in our school that it's for individuals, this is a very uh, more than mastery based learning education. So that's we learning the people or we educate the people through projects. So this is real life projects. So they are immediately working in a real working environment in an agile way. And they are supported by, by a, uh, a technology platform that how they are able to use it physically in the school and also in, in the online platform. And the most, I think, most innovative piece of it that this is a post-payment financial, financial model so that the individuals don't need to pay anything prepay. Uh, they just post-pay after the education when they got the real job. So we providing them a, a job guarantee and they, when they get the first job, they need to just repay the um, curriculum fee. And for businesses, of course, this is how they are able to recruit IT developers and creating corporate upskill and reskilling program. So the good news is that we are growing, uh, and the code code just recently merged with Software Development Academy. Uh, we were the largest player in, in Hungary and, of course, in other countries in the region like Romania and in, um, and in Austria and Poland. Software Development Academy was the largest player in, um, in Poland. Um, and right now, the joint entity is an 18 million euro revenue company with 300 employees, and which is even better numbers that we, the combined entity has 18,000 graduates already and 1,600 mentors. So we have a real power to be able to reskill this part of Europe, and we aim to growing further to being the biggest, uh, the number one choice in, in the uh, European Union. Um, so the active market of um, the combined entity, as you can see so from the Baltics to the Balkan, and uh, we really would like to growing further the the, the countries, and not just in Europe, but beyond Europe as well. What we inno innovate in the methods of uh, learning is that, first of all, that when we started, that was 90% hard skills. So we were clearly focusing on how we are able to educate the people for technology knowledge. But we realized that in a normal working environment, the soft skills is at least the same important. So right now, this is a very well-balanced 50% hard skill and 50% soft skill ed education. Um, as I already mentioned, this is really practice-based learning. And this is also helps that we are able to invite the companies much more closer to the education. So they are able to accelerate which technology and which uh, uh, technology stack is really necessary for their companies and how they are able to 
getting closer to the, to the student much more earlier. So we're working together with huge companies, uh, which is, of course, it's a very nice reference, Vodafone, HSBC, OTP, Raiffeisen Bank, and so on. But what we see, and this is a really good sign, that also the small and medium enterprises are really able to use this reskilled people. And sometimes the SMEs are much more faster in decision making, of course, and they are able to hire the, the best talents, which is a really good sign because simply the quick decision making process is part of our DNA at, uh, at Code Cool and SDA. What you also can see on the, on the slide that that is governmental reskilling programs as well. So we started in a reskilling program for 10,000 ICT specialists in Albania, and we are part of the Hungarian governmental reskilling programs also in, um, here in, in, in the local market, where we already educated 600 engineers who are already working in real uh, working environment. But the big question is that why does the financial sector have special role in this digital skilling? Of course, the, what we realized in this whole education experience, that the domain knowledge is so important. So most of the people who are joining Code Cooler SDA, they already have a career, they have a past, they have a really good uh, education, but not in the digital world. And automatization, how this hitting the financial sector, of course, is what we heard in, an, uh, in the earlier presentation as well, less and less branch and more and more digital. So used to be there was only 20% of the total workforce in a bank worked as IT. Right now, in a neo bank or in a startup bank, that is 80%. And in a, even in the incumbent, this is 40% already. So it means that they need more and more digital talents as a workforce. But on the other hand, because of the shrinking of the, of the physical uh, network and the branch network, they also try to um, automatize and getting less people or less employee. How they are able to make it? Of course, this is the reskilling problem, and this is working very successfully because as I mentioned, the domain knowledge is the key. So they already have domain knowledge about financial sector. It's much more easier to reskill them with or support them with the digital knowledge. And this combined knowledge together is the real essential part of the digital uh, capabilities. So there is a lot of mis misunderstanding about what does it mean, digital skills. People normally thinking about just programmers who, are, who has the real digital uh, skills, but this is not true. When we're talking about literacy, this is the reading and the writing capability. Of course, 100 years ago, there was only, oh, sorry, it's more than 100, 150 years ago, there was only 2% of the population who was able to read and write. And right now, this is a very general skill. This is the same about uh, the digital skills. So. Programmers is just uh, kind of like William Shakespeare of literacy. But we need people who just simply able to read and understand then an article and write and then a new code, which is, to be honest, it's more and more basic year by year. So this is the reskilling asset, what we try to help. And of course, financial education and financial capability is really that how we are able to save all people from the risk of the future. And we, we heard a lot of examples that what is the risk and the threat of the new technologies. But of course, well-educated people are able to defend this type of threats in a much more easier way. So thank you very much. And hope we will meet in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minayu, for your eye-opening presentation. 
Now, I am sure we will hear even more thought-provoking remarks during the upcoming video message of Mr. Manuel Velti, who is the head of Economics, the Swiss National Bank's educational program. Dear conference participants, dear panelists, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. It is a great pleasure and honor for me. Since I unfortunately cannot be on site with you, I am addressing you via this video. My name is Manuel Valti. I am head of economics, the Swiss National Bank's educational program. The mission of economics is to support teachers of economics and humanities at Swiss upper secondary schools and to become integrated in the school context. 14 years after its launch, economics is actively used by 40% of its target group. This makes it the most frequently used supplementary educational program at the Swiss upper secondary level. But now to the topic of this afternoon's panel. I am stating the obvious when I postulate that the future of education will be digital. In the long run, this will undoubtedly be the case. The question is how long the transition will take and what the digital future will look like. According to my personal assessment, this transition will take several years, if not decades. Let me explain why. The digital shift in education typically, typically starts with establishing the necessary infrastructure and with introducing technical means and tools. Switzerland is already well advanced on this path, especially at the upper secondary level, the target group of economics. That means that most students have mobile devices like laptops, tablets, or smartphones. They also have access to a stable internet connection, as well as to learning management systems and cloud services. There is further no shortage of digital educational media of all sorts. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we observe that teaching is still organized in a largely traditional way. From this, we can conclude that it is, it is not enough to just provide digital resources. Instead, also new teaching ideas and new didactic approaches are needed. Approaches that should move us toward a teaching and learning culture, which is in line with the skills required for the 21st century. From this perspective, it is not surprising that the rethinking of teaching does not come easily. After all, convincing digitally supported teaching scenarios do not just happen. Their development and optimization is a lengthy and laborious process. It requires many feedback loops and almost endless adjustments over and over and over. An important prerequisite for success is the involvement of the practitioners, the teachers and the students. Well-designed digital formats are always, always developed in close collaboration with those who will ultimately use and benefit from them. Without such a reality check, hardly anything useful is likely to emerge. Let me conclude by repeating my three key messages. Firstly, at least as important as new digital tools are new ideas on how to use these tools meaningfully and profitably in the classroom. And since there is no patent remedy for this, a lot of trial and error is called for. Secondly, for the development of new didactic approaches, the involvement of teachers and students alike is essential. Finally, it is important to proceed in small steps and with many feedback loops, a process that takes a lot of time and is quite exhausting, but in the end leads to useful solutions. Useful in the sense that these solutions actually work in class, as reliably and robustly as a Swiss Army knife. Thank you for your attention, and now I wish you a successful and inspiring panel discussion.
Thank you, Mr. Valti, for that comprehensive speech. Finally, it is time to move on to the panel discussion dedicated to the role of high-tech innovations in money museums and the development of financial culture. Now, I am pleased to welcome on stage Mr. Zoltan Dubeci, Chief Advisor to the Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, as the moderator of this panel discussion. And let me also introduce our distinguished speakers joining us today. We have Ms. Dita Vernakova, Director of the Czech National Bank's Visitor Center Division, and Ms. Noreen Binti Zulkepli, Director of Hospitality and Museum Department of Bank of Nagera, Malaysia. I'd like to give the floor to you. <clears throat> dear colleagues, dear uh, guests, let me start with the uh, personal experience from today morning. Uh, colleagues from Portugal and from Mexico talked, talked about on, during the previous panel about uh, uh, children different approach and uh, different target groups and about their children, how they use the different, uh, different uh, uh, technical uh, things. Uh, I, uh, my personal experience today morning was that when I transported my, my sons to, to school, early morning, uh, the older one, age of nine, told me that, oh, I will have a, I will have a car with a, with a button inside, and with pushing the button, I will create a lot of candies, as much as I want to. And the small one replied, age of six, oh no, I will have a car, button inside, and I will create a lot of money. And using this money, I can buy anything, what I want. So these are the two different approaches. I think the smaller one won't need any financial education later on, because at the age of six, he is well prepared <laughs> what he needs. So uh, let me start uh, 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 today uh, final or last uh, panel or last discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. We have uh, here Rita Vejnarkova from Prague. Uh, she's the director of the Czech Central Bank Vision Center uh, Division. And we have here uh, Noreen uh, Sulkepfi, uh, director of hospitality and museum department, Bank Negara, uh, Malaysia. So two directors, but uh, the directed department, the name of the directed departments are very much different. Is it makes difference? So I'd like to ask uh, both of you to introduce yourself a uh, little bit, your central bank and also the department what you manage. Please. Hello, um, I'm Noreen, uh, as introduced by uh, Mr. Zoltan. Um, I'm from the Central Bank of uh, Malaysia. Um, been with the bank and the museum, the Central Bank uh, of Malaysia Museum and Art Gallery for 14 years. I practically grew up in the museum and the bank. <laughs> and um, uh, yes, you mentioned about the name of the department. I'm the director of the, the hospitality and museum department, basically taking charge of two different um, areas. Uh, of course, the museum, the place where I first joined, and also recently um, uh, taking charge of the hospitality services of Benigar, uh, Central Bank of Malaysia. So, hospital servi services include um, the FNB, the transportation, the childcare center, uh, the event management, the protocol team, like what the Hungarian, uh, the Central Bank of Hungarian Bank is organizing today. So um, uh, a little bit uh, about the museum we established in 2011, the current museum established in uh, uh, 2011, and on top of raising financial awareness, um, the museum is aimed at enhancing um, uh, awareness, uh, understanding, and appreciation, appreciation on the roles and uh, functions of the bank, the central bank. Uh, the financial economic landscape of uh, Malaysia, as well as uh, the numismatic, the local numismatic and art uh, heritage. And uh, our main activities include uh, six permanent galleries. Uh, you'll see, maybe the organizer can help play the video. So you, can, you guys can better visualize 
what we have inside. So uh, six permanent galleries, uh, two temporary uh, temporary uh, temporary galleries. Uh, thanks to COVID, you know, COVID did uh, did us a favor. We start venturing more seriously into a social media and virtual platform. Uh, two years ago, from uh, social media and virtual platform being a promotional platform for us, is now an alternative platform for educational materials. Um, and of course, uh, we do organize public programs, uh, enrich program, outreach programs. Yeah, that's a little bit uh, about the, uh, the, the bank and also the Central Bank of Malaysia Museum and Art Gallery. Thank you, Dita. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today and uh, not only share, but also to learn from your experiences. Uh, as to uh, the Czech National Bank, uh, it's been uh, really quite active uh, in uh, supporting the financial and economic education for a really long time. And uh, basically, it's been over 20 years when we opened our first exhibition uh, called People and Money, which is uh, presenting the role of, uh, the, of not role, but uh, the Czech currency and the history of uh, the central bank itself. And uh, it's quite interesting because today we are talking about the technologies. And uh, this exhibition is situated in a former vault in a strong room. And there's basically like no technology at all. It's really uh, just about the atmosphere and about the displays, uh, but also actually we do have one uh, activity there, which is lifting the gold bar, which is of course a very, very, uh, very uh, great thing to have. Uh, it is uh, about, uh, let's say, uh, since 2018, uh, when the bank decided uh, to open more uh, to public and to even uh, improve uh, its uh, openness in the field of financial education and its support. And it was decided to create uh, the visitors center. Uh, that means that a new exhibition was uh, created uh, and uh, its aim is to present the role of central bank as you know it these days. But uh, not only listing uh, the, uh, the mandate or the concrete agenda, but uh, to inform of why is it important to have the central bank uh, and uh, how does it affect our everyday lives. So that's the new exhibition which uh, I will show you. I, oh, it's already there, <laughs> okay. Uh, the new exhibition. You can see that uh, it was built in a um, really new place, a former bank hall. We are situated in the city of the Prague, so we are very happy to have uh, all the people passing by uh, on their way to the tourist, uh, tourist places. Uh, but uh, these two exhibitions are not uh, the only parts of uh, the visitor's center. We also uh, do have our archive and our special library. And uh, all these places together basically uh, make the visitor center and the new division, which I'm honored to be the head of. Uh, we also do have uh, the place for uh, temporary exhibitions, even though we are not that active as uh, uh, Noreen and, uh, and their colleagues. Uh, our colleagues, uh, we all only have uh, two exhibitions per year, the temporary ones. But we also do have uh, our outreach program, uh, so we do have a lot of activities uh, which we take outside of our buildings uh, to the regions. And uh, yes, uh, we do have all the special programs as well, especially targeting the kids, families, not only the students, but we will talk about it later on. Um, during this uh, decade, uh, I visited a lot of uh, central banks. And of course, I usually visited the, the museums and my ex personal experience was that uh, uh, a lot of uh, new museums opened or former museums were equipped with a lot of new installments, a new, lot of new technological innovations. So either new museums were opened or or, or a big change were made. Uh, I remember that uh, I visited, when I visited Prague, I visited your former museum, which was a, a little bit, of course, old-fashioned. I visited the uh, Bank Negara in Malaysia. I uh, saw so your uh, new, brand new museum with a lot of uh, technological uh, things inside. So my personal experience is that this is a decade of innovations in the field of money museums because uh, uh, money museums a major part of the money museums renewed in the last 10 years all over the world, not just in Europe, but all over the world. And this renewal 
may, uh, mainly means technology. So uh, to install technology into the museum, I remember the Hungarian Central Bank's former uh, exhibition, a former museum, it was inside the Central bank, bank Building, but it was like a, a showcase of a numismatic uh, collection. It was very old fashioned. It was similar like in the 80s, 90s, or early 2000, but uh, after it we decided, of course, to open a new money museum like this one, what you will see later on after the, the launch. So my question is about how do you see the role of the, of the central banks in this new world of, of technology? Uh, first of all, congratulations to the all uh, new money museum. It's great to see uh, this more and more money museum emerge in the last decade. And most interestingly, to see um, how this museum embraced the innovation, especially in the method of presentation and method of display. Um, for me, I think um, with the rise of technological advancement, um, this wouldn't change much. I, I mean, the, the role of museum, the intrinsic role of museum has not changed. Um, it's still, if you look at the role of museum, the definition, you know, you, any museum in general, including money museum, it says is mandated to collect, preserve, um, present, share, and offer varied uh, experiences of, for educating, for enjoyment. And, but what uh, technological advancement um, did or is doing, I think two things. First one, it enhancing uh, the way the museum interact with the audience. You know, it, we, 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 we came from very passive method of presentation to very immersive, interactive, intuitive. Um, we talk about, you know, we used to, we used to use one-way communication, now it's multi-sensory, it's multi-way, you know. And, um, and also the second part is um, technology adv and advancement also enhances um, the level and also the radius of impact it has on the audience. Um, back days, we talk about a museum as a platform for knowledge sharing. Now we talk about changing behaviors. We talk about call to actions. So these are these are the, these are the changes or these are the en the enhancement that brought by technology advancement that I think actually not change but strengthen the role of museum to be more effective and efficient in educating and giving providing the learning, uh, learning experience to the audience. Well, uh, in our case, uh, it was basically about finding the right balance, I would say, because uh, as I've mentioned, our former museum was uh, really traditional, old fashioned displaying uh, the coins and, and uh, banknotes. With the new exhibition, we knew that uh, it's definitely important to include the technologies, and we did a lot of benchmarking visits uh, to all the different museums, and we uh, saw that uh, the approach is uh, quite different. Uh, in our case, uh, we really wanted to point out and pick up a few technologies and combine them with a great content because uh, we're talking about high technologies. But uh, in my opinion, the question is how long this technology will be still high, whether it's uh, just the technology. And um, also, uh, I mean, uh, today's students, uh, they, as uh, we already discussed here today, uh, they have so many mobile devices. Uh, they are used to all the technologies. But on the other hand, uh, I believe that uh, we people tend to want what is rare. And uh, I think it's just a matter of time when uh, the extensive amount of technology will be just really common. And perhaps that will be the uh, exact moment, as Sylvia mentioned, that uh, people will uh, gather again, uh, tend to come uh, to meet uh, at a great place where the atmosphere is nice, uh, where they feel good. And when uh, somehow, without even noticing, they absorb the information and uh, the education. So that's why we really, uh, while making a concept, uh, concentrated on uh, 
having our main uh, great uh, cinema scope, uh, which is really pointing out when the kids come in. And uh, we do have a uh, lot of screens, a lot of uh, audio systems, but still we really insist on keeping the, the personal point of view. That's why we really uh, try to make our tour guides uh, the best uh, in Prague, I would like to say, because we believe that the right balance of uh, the technologies and the personal approach is the key. And if we are talking about technology in the field of financial education and and uh, financial uh, and in the world of money museums, it's uh, it's a must to mention a few innovations or a few tools or a few. Uh, technological equipments, what you in your central bank use um, in the recent years. Uh, could you mention a few one? Yeah, before before I name a few one, I'd like to just uh, briefly recap, I mean, the uh, the journey of uh, Central Bank of Malaysia in fi uh, raising financial awareness. We started back in 1989 um, started with a very small gallery focusing on the uh, numismatic and the basic of um, uh, money, save, spend, and share. And then uh, in 2011, uh, we rebranded, expanded to to include more uh, financial, economic-related topics uh, with added um, uh, Added technology, a new technology at that time that was that was 11 years ago, and now uh, after 11 years, uh, we are in the midst of um, replacing or enhancing 50 to 60 percent of the exhibit, um, not with the latest technology, but with the fit for purpose um, technology, a better technology, but not the latest technology. Um, and the new uh, exhibits, uh, among others, include uh, immersive uh, dome projection. If you guys, uh, I mean, I had I had the opportunity to visit the House of Music yesterday, and one of the exhibit actually featured the immersive dome projection. So that 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 is uh, the the projection. Uh, we also have the three D projection mapping theater. Um, of course, AR features and interactive projection wall. And of course, I mean, we all we have all this new technology, but we'll uh, still keeping um, the other methods like the practical interactive, such as diorama, games, role playing, and uh, I think it's very good, critical to have a hybrid, a good combination of technology, high technology, as well as uh, conventional method. You know, just to be more inclusive, to cater for more, uh, for um, um, a, a bigger pool of audience that has different, that come from different demographics and also have different uh, learning styles. Yes, basically, I think it's a quite a uh, quite similar approach uh, as we have. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, from our highlights, uh, the uh, great cinema scope. Uh, we have this uh, wonderful wall, which is set up of nine uh, in interactive, uh, transparent uh, displays, where we present all sorts of different content to our visitors. We do have some uh, projections. Uh, we have uh, the simulation of bank board meeting, uh, which is just uh, great, and the uh, uh, visitors love it. And uh, we do have a special audio guide uh, system because our new exhibition is set up in a great big hall and we were really worried about the acoustics. Uh, however, uh, it, we will touch it uh, later on. Uh, we were really careful also with our target groups because of course uh, the kids and students uh, aged 12 to 16 are, are, are our main target groups. However, we wanted uh, our visitor center to be for really everyone, every age. So therefore we were really uh, careful with uh, the methods of presenting and the instruments. And basically our tour guides uh, are quite free in uh, choosing, depending on the age group uh, they are, they are uh, guiding, uh, what way uh, and which, by which instruments to present the information. They know that they need to pass on, but uh, the way they choose, it's kind of up to them. So really that was uh, also very important uh, decision uh, point for us when we were choosing uh, what technologies implement and what not. And uh, as to the uh, immersive uh, things uh, we uh, mentioned before, this is for example something we plan to do next year and I hope it uh, will work out. 
to have this immersive uh, room uh, of, our, of the office of one of our former economists, uh, historical one. So this is something we are looking forward to because we know it's great and people just love it. So hopefully it will work out. Um, you, you've um, raised the target groups. Uh, so which target groups do you approach? Uh, um, uh, please highlight a little bit uh, more deeper which highly uh, target groups approached by your central bank and do you have cooperation with different um, entities in the field of education for example primary schools secondary schools mm -hmm. or maybe universities we all know that different target groups needs are different very much different uh, as to uh, uh, approach uh, a 10 year old uh, school uh, child uh, comparing with a university student. So uh, just to mention an example I experienced in the Netherlands that uh, um, if it was uh, around seven, eight years ago that they decided to um, invite university students in order to guide younger ones. And it was a very good idea from their side because the younger ones as easy here, they are easier following uh, similar or very close age uh, uh, youngsters instead of, for example, listening for me. <laughs> so, uh, please, uh, so about the target groups and your relations about uh, okay. schools and universities. Um, to be honest, um, the museum has something for, for everyone. Uh, but if you ask me about the main target group, I would say um, students and uh, children and students, and also family. Uh, children and students, because uh, you got to teach them young, nurture them young. And family, because um, family itself is a very powerful unit. It has a very powerful influence over one another. So those are our two main target groups. Um, of course, um, we made it compulsory, we made it uh, a very conscious effort on our side to make sure that every, every um, gallery, uh, every uh, new temporary exhibition, every program uh, has uh, allocated a specific program or specific uh, exhibit for different groups of uh, audience uh, that come to the museum. And in terms of cooperation, of course, we've been uh, working very close, closely with Minister of uh, Education and Higher Education in Malaysia since the beginning. Um, these uh, partnerships ranging from uh, official visits, um, uh, collaborative, national level collaborative programs, uh, internship, uh, vol uh, volunteer, and uh, to being uh, featured in the national uh, school textbook. But uh, I, I listened to uh, the, the sharing by the other central, central bank this morning, you know, that, which is very aggressive and very active in our uh, approaching the school. So uh, that is so inspiring. So this is something that uh, we are also at the Central Bank of, uh, uh, bank of Malaysia is venturing, venturing into our, a longer, a long term. Uh, partnership with uh, the school and university, including uh, making uh, financial education part of the syllabus and also creating or developing uh, outside the classroom, outside the classroom program, learning program, as well as uh, a learning uh, teaching kit for uh, teachers at school. Yes. Well. Okay, so as I've mentioned, our main target group uh, are the students aged 12 to 16, because it's exactly the point that at some time the school, they get across the subject of uh, financial or economic education. However, when we were creating uh, the exhibition, the new one, uh, we always uh, were talking about uh, the level of the information that uh, the general public would understand. The average representative of all of, not all of us, because we are sort of uh, in more detail, but uh, the general public would be would be it. I would like to mention one important thing, which was really new to us, because uh, until until uh, May this year, where we when we open, we uh, were targeting the school groups only. We were open only from Tuesday to Friday, and basically there were not much place or space uh, for the families or uh, the other age groups to come and visit us. 
But uh, since May, we're open on Saturdays as well, and therefore our target group, families and uh, the general public, is really important to us, and it's new. Uh, we were uh, very um, occupied uh, the previous years uh, from the schools, so we were not uh, very much worried that they will not come again. But uh, the biggest challenge or the bigger challenge for us were the families, the seniors, and so on. So that was that took us uh, quite a long time to get the programs for them uh, ready, so we can really offer uh, something to them as well. Uh, the other important uh, target group for us are, of course, the teachers, because uh, it would be great if we would uh, live in a world where the kids uh, are begging their uh, teachers in the class, oh, yes, please go to the museum with us. Uh, we know that that does not uh, happen that way, so therefore we are pretty active with communicating with teachers. We do have uh, regular uh, meetings with them. Uh, we discuss uh, what their needs are, what uh, actually uh, are they capable of, because in uh, Czech Republic, uh, the financial education itself, it's not really concretely in the uh, curriculum and the, the syllabus. So some teachers uh, cover this topic in a math class, some uh, cover it in uh, different uh, subjects, but it's really hard for them to uh, basically grab some information and present it uh, to their kids. Uh, so therefore, we want to help them, to be there for them. And uh, that is also why uh, we create a rather a lot of educational material for them uh, so they can study with their kids before they come to see us and after, on, after the visit as a follow-up. And uh, maybe it's uh, also important to mention here that um, we are really concentrate um, mainly on the economical education in the means of uh, the role of central bank. So basically in our exhibitions, uh, the visitors do not uh, learn that much about uh, let's say personal finances or other topics which are usually covered by other institutions or organizations. So that is something what makes us uh, rather unique, I would say. And uh, so far as we had the feedback from the from the uh, teachers, it is appreciated. And uh, as to the uh, collaborations or uh, or uh, the partnerships, of course, we not only uh, are in uh, detailed discussions with the secondary schools, but also the universities, also the Ministry of uh, of uh, Finance and other institutions. So that's quite quite the same here. I, I just like to add that um, our range of age uh, will start from uh, as early as five years old, and that it, that is why we have uh, a special children's gallery. Uh, I guess that uh, both central banks and those three central banks have a lot of uh, visits, uh, and of course a lot of different events, additional events. Um, what kind of uh, technological equipment do you use to organize these uh, visits? I guess thousands or ten thousands of students and families coming uh, year by year. So, what kind of technology do you use? Um, in um, Bank Negara Malaysia, most of the visits are walk-ins because we we want we try to be as uh, much accessible as possible. Uh, but for for those uh, group visit, they have to request in advance uh, before they came before they come to the museum. And but for walk-ins, uh, they just need to scan QR code uh, for it to register upon entering the museum. But for tour, uh, if you talk about the guided tour, we are still doing it uh, con conventionally, uh, where we have our gallery assistant that walk the visitors through um, the gallery. Uh, but uh, in terms of registration that you mentioned just now, we are we are using the online registration for group for big group for uh, for group visits. Uh, but in the future, to ease uh, uh, this uh, administrative uh, burden of uh, having to handle registrations and organizing events things like that, we are in the midst of um, developing our mobile app. Uh, that would uh, mainly uh, help uh, the visitors to self-navigate within the museum. And most importantly, I think this is uh, it would be very helpful to us because it would uh, help address the issue or the problem of, of um, ever escalating numbers of visitors versus uh, very uh, lean resources. 
So this is one of the approaches that we hope that would help us on th that area. Yep. Uh, well, we are uh, kind of old-fashioned in this way, in this field, uh, because we uh, mainly have our reservational system on our website. We do have a special website presenting, of course, uh, all the offers uh, of the visitor center. So uh, the groups of uh, the school groups or the groups of uh, with a bigger amount of visitors are uh, suggested to register uh, because, of course, due to the capacity of the center, which is uh, almost 200 people, we need to make sure that uh, we have a place uh, ready for them. However, uh, same at the uh, Bank Nikare Malaysia, we allow people to come uh, to see us uh, just from the street. Uh, so basically any family, any individual who is uh, willing to come and uh, explore our exhibitions is invited. Uh, to be honest, it was something we were rather um, worried about for the first time when we were thinking about this model, how it's going to work out, uh, whether there will be like uh, security troubles with this or uh, so, um, basically the logistics of the of the guides. But I have to say that it works, so we are happy that uh, that it uh, really really turned out to go well. But uh, as I mentioned, we are open since uh, May. Uh, there were summer holidays, so no many, no many students coming in. Uh, so we'll see what the future will bring, and maybe uh, in some times we'll be thinking about uh, new methods as well. But uh, for now, the registrations are working. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you need more experience because of opening in May. Summer is summer, so not for many museums, visits for uh, students, and of course, uh, experience uh, needed to evaluate. Uh, my next question is about what points of view did you consider uh, when you decided how to choose the different or the right equipment? We also had a lot of conversations here in the Central Bank of Hungary uh, with different approaches advised to, to us, but what were your considerations? There are a few factors that we take into consideration when we are building up uh, an exhibit. I think one, uh, the first one would be the nature of the audience, the target group, uh, the age, I think the age and also the category and also uh, the size of your, the, the audience. And, you know, for example, um, if you're talking, you're building an, an exhibit for kids, for children, uh, you may want to have something with kinesthetic experience, kinesthetic element, because you know children learn best by doing hands-on experience. And you must also consider the size of audience. Uh, um, is it a multi, a single user, multi-user, or you want your, your, your audience to interact with, you, with each other? So that is one. The second, the second one would be the nature of content or subject. Um, of course, when you talk about central bank museum, some topic can be very technical, can be very dry, can be very intimidating. So those kinds of uh, content may require a little bit high tech uh, technology just to pick interest and grab attention. And the last factor, I think, um, the credibility of the, te the technology. Um, so we saw uh, so many technologies coming in and out, you know, uh, you m but we, we must ensure that the technology that we are adopting is something which is, has already been fully tested, matured enough, uh, you know, is, is suitable for, for long-term usage. Well, in our case, it was uh, mainly about the diversity we were looking for, uh, and uh, of course, uh, aiming at uh, different target groups uh, differently, as I mentioned before. But also, uh, we really wanted to keep the personal approach there, uh, to be in contact with our visitors, and also uh, to provide them with an experience. Because in our case, uh, the central bank, the Czech National Bank, was really sort of this mysterious place before we opened uh, up. And uh, still, when the uh, visitors come in, you can see the wow effect uh, that they are in the central bank, uh, and it works. And uh, we also wanted them to share this experience. And therefore, for example, we do not have uh, yet, talking nowadays, we'll see what the future brings, 
for example, the mobile app in the exhibition, because we wanted them uh, to lift their eyes up from the screen and uh, really just uh, be there, touch the things, uh, talk to each other. On the other hand, we do have, for example, the mobile app uh, for our escape game outside the building. Uh, that is something which we believe uh, will work and uh, is uh, basically uh, like really, really uh, popular. Uh, for example, the other, other thing we were thinking about was the virtual reality, which was very popular, still is very popular. But as I mentioned, uh, we wanted uh, the group to share share the experience. And uh, with the virtual reality, unless you have uh, like 30 uh, gl these glasses, it's not really uh, possible. So in our exhibition, uh, every time you are, uh, you are uh, basically uh, supposed to do some activity, either interactive or physical even, uh, you can uh, share it with others. They can cheer you up, uh, they can look what you do. And uh, that way we believe that the experience and, uh, and uh, the whole feeling of uh, visiting us will help the visitors to really soak in the information. What kind of um, challenges and limitations do you see in the, in the future in front of your central yeah. bank? I think one is uh, the technology advancements is very dynamic, is ever evolving. Um, you know, we just don't want to be trapped in the catching up game. Uh, but I think as long as we um, we keep uh, or we stick to the fit for purpose, uh, fit for objective principle, then we'll be fine. Uh, and another thing is cost. I mean, technology, of course, cost is very high. Uh, more challenging if we want to match um, the investment, uh, the investment and uh, the ROIs, be it tangible or non-tangible, is very challenging. Um, the third one, I would say, uh, the societal uh, society readiness uh, adapting uh, using this uh, technology, technology, technology uh, innovations. Um, and like like it it was mentioned in the earlier uh, session, uh, digitalization. Whether your audience is uh, really fully uh, digital literate, that is also uh, some some concern that uh, you know uh, some some limitation. Yeah. Oh. I totally agree with Noreen here. Uh, and uh, in, um, in our case, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the challenges will uh, for us definitely be to keep the diversity there, to keep coming up uh, with the new uh, things because uh, we always wanted uh, the visitor center to not, be, not only be like one shot only. We want our visitors to come back to uh, really uh, make it uh, not only for the kids but uh, for everyone to know that there's some there's a lot to learn. Uh, they definitely cannot uh, see everything at uh, one time, uh, and uh, there is so much uh, for them uh, present. And uh, just keep uh, the the programs and uh, the the uh, instruments uh, coming up. Of course, the cost is always a big <laughs> big. Uh, trouble, but uh, really to stay in touch with uh, the, the world evolving uh, and uh, keep bringing some new new stuff from time to time. Still. Thank you, uh, directors. Um, we still have a few minutes left. I'd like to ask the audience if uh, there is any questions or maybe comments from your side. We have microphones over there, so do not hesitate to ask questions or raise comments. If there is no question or comment, I'd like to thank you for your very uh, interesting uh, contribution. Uh, we learned a lot uh, from you and from the Central Bank of uh, Malaysia, Bank Negara, and uh, Central Bank, and also I would like to visit your new exhibition if it's possible, in order to at least order to buy a cufflink like this. This one, because I, I bought it in, in Kuala Lumpur in Bank Negara. There's a banknote, cut it banknote inside, just to remember your our, our meeting a few years ago. But I hope that it's available in your 
in the museum shop as well. It will be now. Will be. Thank you. So thank <laughs> you for your attention. Thank you, ladies and directors. And I'd like to close this uh, uh, panel discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for, to the panel. It was truly a lively and insightful discussion. With the closing of this session, we have reached the end of today's conference. I am sure you all agree with me when I say we had an insightful and rewarding day. Our distinguished speakers have guided us through topical and intriguing questions about challenges when it comes to financial education. I would like to thank all of our speakers and participants for sharing their great insights and our audience for staying with us during the program. In case you missed any of the parts of the conference or if you'd like to watch our program again, please visit the YouTube channel of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank where the recording of the entire event will be available. Thank you for being here with us today. Stay safe and healthy for our online audience. And for those